three. I call this be in order. Go ahead. Did it three times. I call this meeting to order. Very good. Well done, well done. Mr. Canellis, if you're able to call roll. Ms. Calvez. Here. Ms. Carasola. Here. Ms. Carr. Here. Mr. Corey. Here. Ms. Scarpelli. Here. Ms. Stevenson. Here. Ms. Rundell. Here. Dr. Robinson. Here. We have a quorum. Excellent. Can we have the flag salute, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Adequate notice of meeting in accordance with PL 1975 chapter 231 notice of tonight's meeting was mailed to the record and the Ridgewood News on January 9th, 2024. Notice of this meeting was also mailed to the borough clerk and was posted on the bulletin board of the Board of Education office in the administration building on the same date. All right. Would you be able to read our mission statement, please? Founded on principles of education and partnership with the supportive community, providing exceptional education to all students to cultivate resilient, responsible, and engaged global citizens. Thank you, Mr. Laurel. Well, good evening, everyone. We have some special guests uh, today from, from Bird Elementary. Uh, we have River, uh, B and Ryan here. River and B are both in second grade, correct? Second grade, and Ryan is in fifth grade. And I know that our board members had some questions that they wanted to ask um, uh, River and B, if that's okay. And they're going to ask you some questions. You can kind of give us uh, some answers. Sound good? <coughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Rundell first, if that's okay. Ms. Rundell? All right. So I want to know what your favorite thing about Bird is. My favorite thing about Bird is that everyone is nice to each other. My my favorite thing about Bird um, are um, there's my fr friends and the theme days are pretty fun. Thank you. I do have something. Thank you. Um, what's, what's your favorite subject? My favorite subject in school is science because we get to do fun experiments. My favorite subject in school is math because you get to do fun games and doing and doing math in your head is, I think is fun. I agree, math in the head is fun. Um, so I wanna know what's your favorite thing about your teacher? My favorite thing about my teacher is um, she tells funny jokes and she helps me learn. Um, Miss Peterson is really kind. For example, when people are misbehaving, she doesn't yell at them. She just says something like, please don't do that. Also, she makes learning fun. Excellent. Excellent. And so if you could be principal for a day, what would you do? Um, if I were principal... If I were principal for a day, um, when the kids were at recess, I would go outside and um, if they're doing something bad, I'll try to stop them. <laughs> um, first, I would, it would be pajama day. Then we would get candy at the beginning of the day. Then we would do an all-grade soccer game. Everybody would get the ball. Then we would watch a movie with popcorn. Also, we would all drive in an orange Lamborghini to the mall <laughs> and eat at the, f the food court that's for lunch. After that, we would go back in time to meet Pele, the soccer star. Then we would go and pet tigers, and Elon Musk would give us whatever we want in a million dollars. Then we would go home on the billion-dollar program. That's all. 
<laughs> Sounds like a great day you have planned. <laughs> Well, how do I follow up my question with that? <laughs> if you can change one thing about bird school, what would it be? Um, I would build signs so no one will do graffiti on the playground. I would get a, I would get a bigger gym. <laughs> Sell your Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. right? Those are excellent, excellent answers. Does any more trustees have any questions for our wonderful two second graders, River and B? You did a wonderful job. Thank I you. Too. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question. Yes. Well, how did you get to see the eclipse at all today? Yes. Oh, what were your um, thoughts? I did also, but I kept looking at it without my goggles <laughs> because I just wanted to. But then I quickly looked away because I remembered. Oh, wow, okay. All right. I know. You got to be able to see that orange Lamborghini, so I'm really glad that you did, you know. <laughs> okay. Keith, can we edit that last part out? <laughs> thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I believe, uh, thank you. You were wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Ryan, I believe you have a, a whole report on overall on Bird, right, for fifth grade. Could you share that with us, please? Hi, my name is Ryan Loro, and I'm a fifth grader at Bird School. My favorite thing about Bird School is the spirit, spirit days we do. My favorite teacher at Bird School is Miss Marks. She was my second grade teacher. She is my favorite teacher because she was always so kind and made learning much more fun than it would have been without her. Some of my favorite activities that we have at Bird are community groups, multicultural night, the Harlem Wizards, and student council. Community groups are a time where students from all grades get together in small groups to learn about each other and build community. This year we are focused on ruler and learning about our feelings. Multicultural night was on Friday and was a big success. It was a great way to learn about other cultures and eat yummy food from places around the world. The Harlem Wizards came to Glen Rock on March 10th. This is our biggest fundraising event of the year. I love this event because we get to watch our teachers and business owners from our town play basketball. The Harlem Wizards also do giveaways and raise a lot of money for bird school. Shout out to all the parents, especially my parents, who made this event possible. The Bird Student Council is working really hard to make everyone at our school feel special. This year, they've donated, they've had donation drives, spirit days, and are working on one final event to, the, to end the school year. I can't wait to see what it is. Thank you, Ryan. Does any trustees have any questions for, for, for Ryan? Ryan, who was the best basketball player among the teachers? Mr. Bogan. Oh, okay. Good to know. Ryan, who is the worst one? No, don't say that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so it sounds like things are going really well at, at Bird, and we do appreciate uh, you sharing that very detailed report. What was your thoughts on the eclipse today? I thought that it was really cool and that it doesn't happen as much, so I was really happy that I got to witness it after school. My friends at soccer earlier today said the next solar eclipse is going to happen 20 years. Is that true, or will it happen um, in? I forgot what was not. Will it happen soon? You know, thankfully, we have a science expert here who knows everything, Miss Scarpelli. Can you please <laughs> let us know when that's going to happen? Yeah. Well, actually, Ryan and I talked earlier before the meeting, so Ryan definitely can answer that for us. Yeah. It depends if it's a total eclipse or if it is a partial eclipse well we look forward to it again so again wonderful job let's give our readers a round of applause they were excellent
Mr. Ayalante, are we good for uh, wrestling yet or no? Yes, we're ready. Okay, so now we have um, our, our Director of Athletics, uh, Mr. Frank Violante, who's going to speak about uh, Jake Rickett. Um, we also have Corey Fitzpatrick here, the varsity wrestling coach. Jake was a District 2 champion. Excellent. So, Mr. Violante and Mr. Fitzpatrick. Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Coach Corey Fitzpatrick, who's been our wrestling coach for the last 11 years. When Corey got here, our program was, let me choose the word, it was kind of shaky with uh, a handful of wrestlers, but he's done a wonderful job. We're in the mid-20s this year. We won a league championship two years ago. Uh, he's done an outstanding job. The kids really like him. He's a good gentleman, teaches the kids well, and he's always there for the young men. And uh, if you ever go to one of his practices or go to a match and watch how they react to him, I think you'll uh, you'd be very impressed. Uh, but he's in trouble because he dressed better than I did tonight. So, <laughs> so your schedule is going to be bad next year. But Coach Corey Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Uh, tonight we would like to honor senior captain Jake Rickett of the Glen Rock High School wrestling team. Uh, Jake has just capped off an excellent final senior season for the Panthers in the 285 pound weight class. Jake accomplished many accolades throughout the season, most notably the following. In January, Jake had a third place finish at the prestigious Bergen County Tournament. Jake then went, uh, went on to win the uh, NJSIAA District 2 wrestling tournament, becoming Glen Rock's first district champion in 11 years. Following his district championship win, Jake then won back-to-back uh, back -back matches at the NJSIAA Region 1 Wrestling Tournament, earning himself a spot in the Region 1 Finals. In doing so, Jake became the first Glen Rock wrestler to make the Region Finals since 2000. And to finally cap it off, Jake's Region Final appearance earned him a spot in the NJSIAA Individual State Wrestling Tournament at, Boardwalk, uh, at Historic Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City. Uh, Jake's individual state wrestling tournament appearance also became Glen Rock's first since 2013. Uh, with all that being said, we'd like to congratulate Jake Rickett on an exceptional senior season. Please come up, Jake Rickett. Right. Yes, yes. Coach Fitzpatrick was in Charleston in charge. That's how he got famous. Um, coach, who would win between you and Jake? Just so we're curious. Who would you got? Probably be, uh, so we set up a ring double here. Overtime. Double overtime. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Probably Jake again. at this point. <laughs> okay. Um, at this time, I think we have in the back uh, robotics. So we have Mr. Locatell. I know uh, Professor Murray's out. On, uh, he's out sick. But Mr. Locatell and our robotics team, come on up.
Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to stall very quickly while they start to set some stuff up for the board. Um, I just want to point out that this is Mr. Locatell and Mr. Mure's third year yep. as the robotics coaches. Uh, since that time, we've over doubled the program in size. We have now two teams competing as opposed to just one. So I'm going to talk just for a moment about what that's meant to the program. Um, this year, both teams qualified for the state tournament, which has not happened in Glen Rock. They've qualified once before, but we put two teams and a first-year team into the state tournament. Um, the students have worked really hard, countless hours during the summer, after school, on weekends, and as a result, the teams did very well. I'll let Mr. Locatella tell you exactly how they did, but um, something I'd like to point out is that Coach Locatell was voted the Robotics Coach of the Year. So it's a great honor that's very well deserved. So at this point, I'll turn it over. Thank you so much, Mr. Cusack, and uh, good evening. And thank you so much for providing us the opportunity to come and not only demonstrate for you, but also provide me the opportunity to uh, brag about my students. For if you do know me, uh, one of my uh, fatal flaws is that I am anything but concise and especially so when uh, I am provided the opportunity to brag about my students. Um, and nothing could be more exciting for me after the incredible season that these students have participated in. Over the last eight months, these students have accomplished some incredible feats. Uh, so much so that usually I go out here and just wing this because I'm pretty confident in my ability to speak about these things, but I had zero confidence in my ability to be able to speak to you about the laundry list of accomplishments that these students have accomplished. So <clears throat> I'll get to that in a moment, and in the meantime, please enjoy the two robots since this is our first year since we had so much interest that we actually were able to field two separate teams and then begin to provide the opportunity for students as young as seventh grade to participate in it since the robotics competition allows for seventh through twelfth. And that was great because we had a huge influx of students extremely interested in participating in robotics and learning all the different things. So as I'm speaking, you'll see the two robots picking up all those little hexagonal pixels and then trying to score it on that backdrop in the back, a simplified version of what these students did over the last eight months. So let's talk about a couple of the things that these folks did. One of the most impressive things to me is the amount of outreach that they participated in. Since it's not just about the competition, it's also about getting out there and enthusing students and adults alike about robotics. These folks participated in half a dozen different outreach events over the course of the last eight months. Going to the Bridgewater Mall and participating for the public. Creating a STEM camp for elementary students in the Glen Rock educational system. Mentoring an FLL, a first Lego League comp er, team. Um, at one of the elementary schools, doing scrimmages for several different teams all across North and Central Jersey that came to this school and asked actually to come back since we did such a great job of being hosts for the different teams and the competition. And then also providing a place for professionals to come in here and critique these students' work, both from a design perspective and a tournament. We even actually had a host of the NBC show Hot Wheels Challenge uh, zoom in and provide us critique on the design in which we were having with the portfolio. So overall, an insane amount of outreach. Then we moved to the competition space where last year we participated in three competitions with one team. This year we participated in eight competitions with two teams, one in which we hosted, and as Mr. Cusack said, both teams out of the 183 teams in the state of New Jersey qualified for states and then made the playoffs during states. Both teams are in the top 24 in the state. And then one of the teams, our rookie team, the Galactic Pigeon in the orange jerseys, actually went on to win states with two other teammates and they are state champions. So <laughs> yeah, no, a fantastic accomplishment for all these kids. The majority of the students on the rookie team had no idea anything about robotics before September. Um, and the amount of mentoring that our senior team, 8902, did uh, was nothing but uh, nothing short of, of a miracle. And I couldn't be more proud. Uh, and that was why it was so honoring when these students uh, uh, nominated me for Coach of the Year. And then uh, I was honored enough to win that as well. So it was uh, beautiful. Um, and then <laughs> Mr. Yon and one of my students actually figured out how much time these folks put in 
after school and on the weekends just from September. It was 400 plus hours. It is an insane amount of work for these students to put this all this outreach together for all these different students across the building, but then also do all the competition work. And there is so many of us now. I mean, the Schoology page has 90 students alone, and we're only allowed to bring 30 to any given competition. So the support from both the district, these students, and then from you folks, especially for some of you that came out to the competition, uh, it's been an honor. So thank you so much for allowing us to come here, present a little bit, talk about it, allow me to brag. And then I did, I'm not going to list off all 90 names, but. I do want to uh, mention the different captains of our two teams and once again uh, provide them the opportunity to be recognized by this board and the public. So uh, Craig Hillier, Evie Hu, Caitlin Kim, Noah Lee, Joseph Yu, Miguel Acero, and Selena Fang are just a few of the incredible students I have the privilege of working with. So thank you so much and uh, please a round of applause for these beautiful girls. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Locatel. Um, it's just amazing what, what you, uh, Professor Murray, and your students have done over the last, last couple of years. Um, and we'll say that you are, without a doubt, the biggest cheerleader at the, <laughs> at, 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 at the events, uh, at the competitions. Rob, what, what, so the board and I are very supportive uh, of robotics. We want to see it continue to flourish. Um, you have the board's attention here. You have my attention. What are some things that, that you need for us to provide even additional support. For, yeah, so for I mean, right now, uh, we love the amount of support that we do get, but it's extremely expensive to run this stuff, and we have three sponsors. We were actually able to, to you know, get three sponsors for this season, but there's no guarantee that they'll be coming back next season. And I know the amount of work that me and Mr. Murray put in, I, I, you know, I am guilty of even putting some of my own money up in order to make sure that, that these folks will be able to uh, perform at the level that they want to. So the amount of time, the amount of money, and everything uh, is definitely going to be, I mean, it, it's, it's taxing, it's draining. For me, it's worth it. But any amount more to be able to compete with schools like Don Bosco, who has six teams in this league, two teams in another league, and four teams in another league. Um, and none of them went to states. And we had two teams that went to states. So don't get me wrong, I'm very proud of what they've been able to accomplish, but any little bit of support, either from a financial end or showing up to the events and the competitions, would definitely go a long way to, to make these students feel that you know, their accomplishments are paying off. And then the, you know, the 400 plus hours that me and Mr. Murray also, uh, you know, that pays off as well. So um, any amount of support in that regard, it, it goes a long way and very much appreciated. So. I do need some direction later on separately about the rules of the competition. It's when extremely I went, I didn't confusing. It. Don't worry. But <laughs> I did notice at the competition that that little paper airplane can go flying. So I was wondering it if we, we could We didn't shoot. want to send it off to anyone. <laughs> but I think, he, I think he would enjoy it. <laughs> anyway, no, you, great so job. You, you want to fire? No. Okay. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank you for all you're doing for it. Um, we love to see the growth and the progress. Um, the two teams is amazing. So, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, definitely we'll be, we'll clearly see you all the time. We'll be in touch. We'll work with Mr. Cusack to make sure that you have everything you need to continue the success that you've had. And we really appreciate it. We're so lucky to have you on staff. And, and so appreciate thank that. you. And we're so lucky to have wonderful students there working with you. It's uh, one of the great things about Glen Rock. So thank you. That's what I appreciate. It. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Rob, we're going to take a quick picture if yeah, we can with everybody. Okay. Okay. Who's on this left? Pigeon on this right. How about that? All right, facing that way, folks. Facing that way. We should be behind. Okay, come on over. Come on over. As soon as we can build robots, we can get together for a picture. I believe this. How do you make the names? So the, I inherited the Cosmic Goose as a name. Uh, as far as I understand, it was made because somebody had made the logo in a graphic design class, and they just thought it was incredible. And then after I made the second team, or I thought, I even thought about making the second team this year, I definitely wanted to keep the, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the bird theme. So whenever we have a, a going against each other, we say, go space bird. So we'll, we'll, have, we'll do that on three then, all right? Here, come on in.
at this time, we'd like to take just a two-minute um, intermission. Uh, intermission? I couldn't think of the word. So 7.32. Recess. Recess. <laughs> intermission. Like intermission. by Ms. Caracella. <coughs> All in favor? All in favor. Aye. Thank you. Are back into our public session. No, those are yours. All right, uh, Dr. Charleston. I, um, You're logging in. I think I'm doing, right? No, uh, middle school. Oh. Okay, so we have one more uh, presentation. If you remember, about I guess three, three, three years ago, um, we. Uh, came up with what we call the middle school reimagine uh, plan, which was a, a, a three-year process in, in terms of making some changes to the middle school. Um, and we thought since we kind of put a bow on the bird pilot, um, which was a departmentalization, we think it would be a nice, uh, a good opportunity now to put a bow on middle school reimagination plan. Not that we're stopping with things we're doing, but kind of just giving a great overview of what's occurred the last three years and where we're at. So I have uh, Ms. Giorlando, Mr. DeRosa, and I think Mr. Cusack here as well uh, to present. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Giorlando. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, I just want to open by saying that Mr. DeRosa is here tonight, and I told him to take some notes from what River had to say because that was, that was some pretty good stuff of principal for a day. So um, just wanted to start with that. Uh, so Middle School Reimagined, our update, we had our 21-22 launch, and we've been building on those updates over the last two years. So this is, this is year three for us. Um, the next few slides that we'll talk about with philosophy are all based on the principles espoused by the Association for Middle Level Education. And really the purpose of that is to emphasize the idea that we don't want to forget about middle school kind of crunched between elementary and high school, that they have their own patterns of learning, that there's specific um, tenets of adolescent development that are important for us to remember when we're talking about middle schoolers. Um, so when you look at culture and community as the first tenet of the AML philosophy, um, the core values, we try very hard to infuse those throughout our instruction and our classroom and school culture overall. And then the strategies and the services exemplify that team philosophy. Philosophy. So each of our students has an adult advocate who's on the team, um, either it's the team leader or another one of the teachers. Um, in terms of the counseling and support services, we have one counselor per grade level that follows that grade for the three years, and we have the services of the wellness team, and then students, if they need additional services, they could move to intervention and referral services, and potentially 504 or CST, so it's a continuum of a comprehensive services for them. In terms of our safety measures, we have the school safety team, the threat assessment team, the crisis response team. Mr. DeRosa and I are working on a more 
our restorative discipline approach. So we've been collecting some data this year and we'll be rolling out more on that next year. Um, and then in terms of our partnerships, we're always looking for ways to communicate proactively, whether it's through emails, positive phone calls, workshops, and we've been doing more transition programming. So that's the one tenet there of that culture and community that we really have been working on over those last three years. In terms of curriculum instruction and assessment, you have uh, your departmentalization of your subject areas, so our teachers are highly qualified um, in each of those areas. We integrate those other health and wellness and SEL competencies not only throughout, but also through health and PE and through our advisory program, and then rolling out ruler with the staff this year and students next year like we've done in elementary school. Um, and then the last three bullets there are really all about the instruction being based on a really high level of engagement and our assessments being based on problem solving, analysis, and critical thinking. So when I, I've had the benefit of going into classrooms and seeing the teachers teach these really highly engaging lessons and I understand now why I don't know math as well as our students do because they're doing those big thinking classrooms and they're getting up and they're problem solving and they have the whiteboards and you know I had a teacher who was like memorize all of these uh, multiplication tables so it's really great to see that engaging learning and the kids thinking about thinking that really high level of metacognition. Um, and then in terms of leadership and organization, we really are working on that shared vision. Mr. DeRosa meets with the team leaders at least monthly. They have those regular meetings. And one of the, um, one of the things that he's brought to those meetings is this idea of one success and one challenge. Let's, let's share one success and one challenge. And that's really just along the mindset of how are we continuously improving. Um, so that's a really nice partnership there. Um, in terms of our policies and procedures, we set school-wide expectations and we communicate those to the students, um, particularly through our quarterly meetings, but just in, in definitely in being in the hallways and being there to uh, interact with them on a regular basis. Um, and then our teachers, like I said, they're willing to try new things, they work closely together on interdisciplinary projects, and they're really dedicated to the students' learning. So when you put all of those together, um, that really creates purposeful learning and meaningful relationships for our students. They're starting to think, who am I as a student academically, socially, emotionally? How do I contribute to my community, and how does my community support me? Um, so it's a really nice, uh, meshing of all of the different ideas. Um, and then we did also move to the rotating drop bell schedule um, after that first year. Um, and like we've said all along, it takes the kids about a day or two, and they are fully immersed, and they know, they know where they're going and what they're doing. But you can see a list of the different benefits of the rotating block schedule, where they're meeting with their teachers at different times of the day, so that, uh, that benefits different uh, learning styles. Um, they have longer times uh, to be in class, so that is for project-based learning and presentations. Um, that helps as well. And then we've been able to share staff more in terms of middle school and high school teaching and have them have professional development that um, is more universal on a continu continuum 6 through 12. Um, so those are all of the points in terms of just the philosophy and moving forward. And Mr. DeRose is going to talk more specifically about how teams have evolved over time. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So we started the middle school teams in 2021, and but we did this by bringing in expert and author of successful middle school teaming, Jack Berkemeyer, to work with us. And he started off by helping us to really develop the protocols for our meetings, as well as introduced us to the five elements of teaming. And those elements of teaming are based around student advocacy, regular check-ins to review student progress, consistency among teachers, the maintaining all student communication and parent contacts, as well as coordinating the team assessment schedule. Um, in year one, we had the building-wide launch in September with our supervisors serving as team leaders, running team meeting. And as the year continued, teachers applied and were chosen to be the next team leaders and then attended summer training in 2022. In that second year, the appointed teachers 
and appointed teachers took over as team leaders while Jack Berkmeyer returned once again to work with the leaders visiting every grade and team. From there, last summer, we had one leader from each grade level receive additional AMLE training and our leaders created our advisory program, which I'll be speaking about shortly. We're in our second year right now with the teacher team leaders and we're reviewing our options for PD for this upcoming summer. Um, moving along. There we go. Uh, we find the success of any team really comes down to how the team interacts and works together, the teamwork that's built. And what we found is that the increased collaboration leads to greater connection and consistencies. Um, for example, there's more inter interdisciplinary planning between subjects, leading to cross-cutting concepts such as CER or claim evidence reasoning making its way out of the science room and into math, social studies, and English. The increased dialogue and frequent review of students also allows teachers to identify and see how students are trending. Are we seeing students excel across the board? Are they having difficulty in one subject? And that really just sets up the dialogue for our teachers to figure out how best to support our students. What are we going to put in place for them? Um, lastly, what I want to talk about is the team initiatives that I've been able to see since I've been here. Cards to Unsung Heroes, I think, is I mean, I had to hand those out to the crossing guard, Nando, across the street. And you could see how touched he was by that. It's these opportunities to me that when I first got to Glenrock and I spoke about, it's, you know, what are we doing for the community and how are we interacting with this community? You could see how touched Nando was. Um, and then also the March Madness book competition in sixth grade. Teachers were paired, or I should say students were paired together in teams to see who could read the most pages and most books, and the group that won had the honor of playing the staff and myself in basketball. Um, you know, I'm not going to go off on a tangent right now, but I mean, I, I mean, it was, it was two deep threes, Dr. Charles. Really? It was two deep Wow. Threes. I got it on video, but I'm okay. not going to talk about that like right Caitlin now. Like Caitlin Clark deep three, like logo threes, or I, like, like elementary school threes? I mean, I'll, I'll show you the video. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a little bit beyond the logo. I think the video could lie, but let's check it out. Right, thank you. <laughs> And then moving on to talking about advisory. Um, our advisory program was created to support the school culture that Mr. Orlando had spoke about earlier by strengthening and building our students' emotional intelligence. Um, in this first year, we focused on our four core values that you could see and infusing them into our school community every day. Advisory creates a dialogue and it sets an expectation for how our students feel, act, and regulate themselves. As this program continues, it will evolve and merge with RULER, which our staff is currently working on right now. Going forward, the advisory program will continue to help our students understand the value of emotions, build their emotional intelligence, and elevate our school climate further. We found the strength of, or really the success of our advisory program, lies in the new groupings as far as students getting to interact with each other from other teams as well as other teachers that they might not have the chance to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it also sheds new light for our students on how they see the staff, as teachers regularly share their own experiences in these sessions. And lastly, the advisory program gives our students the guidance to better navigate adolescence so that our students could be their best, resulting in less behavioral issues, not just now, but in the future as well. So it's all about just setting them up for the future. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm back, second round. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the scope and sequence. There were two large um, changes in the structure of the middle school when we did this reimagined plan. The first thing was the breaking down of the block. So sixth graders would stay with a sixth grade teacher for three subjects, uh, either in the morning or the afternoon where it was, it was uh, ELA, social studies, and writing. So what we've done in the reimagined plan was break that out. Um, as Principal Gerlando spoke earlier, it allows us to have teachers who are subject-specific content experts teaching a specific course to the students. So in ELA in the sixth grade, um, the teachers still maintain that common planning time, both within their teams and across their grade levels, so that they still can plan co-curricular 
activities, but now we have social studies teachers teaching, social studies teachers, ELA teachers teaching English, uh, and ELA teachers teaching writer's workshop. Um, in seventh grade, writer's workshop used to be an elective that students could take. Uh, all students do now take that, and we now offer additional supports where there are ICS classes where students are able to take that as well. Um, all of the teachers were involved in the curriculum writing in sixth grade, so we didn't just have a small group. We had the social studies, the ELA, the writer's workshop teachers all involved to make sure that they were hitting all different aspects of the curriculum and that everything that was being done in the block was being covered. Uh, social studies, again, we broke up the block. Sixth grade social studies is now a standalone course. It actually helped us too because it realigned and redefined what we were doing. Uh, one of the main reasons too was there was the New Jersey State Learning Standards revisions in 2020. Um, and there was also the Laura, Wo uh, Laura Wooten Law for civics mandate in 2021. So with those changes, it really was the perfect time for us to make this change and have that standalone sixth grade course. We aligned it with the fifth grade, what they're doing in the elementary schools. So they do colonial history and civics. So our sixth grade social studies now covers 1754 to 1877. In seventh grade, they get civics. And in eighth grade, they get world history, which is then the precursor to our ninth grade, either world history or AP world history courses. Uh, the teachers were all provided with, <clears throat> excuse me, external professional development and curriculum writing time as well. And for mathematics, um, the committee reviewed the program and we had algebra for everybody in eighth grade um, prior to the reimagined plan. So in 21-22, the committee reviewed the program and curriculum support materials. Summer of 23, they wrote the curriculum for the two new pathways. Um, in 22-23, those pathways were implemented, so all students come in and take sixth grade math. In seventh grade, it splits into two different pathways. Um, and those materials and curriculum were adopted in 22-23. Uh, in 20, summer of 23, there was revisions. Obviously, anytime you start something new, you want to evaluate it, see where it is, make revisions. Um, so this is the second year of implementation. A notable point, in grade eight, 65% of students met or exceeded state expectations on the math assessment in 22-23, which is a 16% increase from 21-22. Now my favorite part, uh, the electives. Um, as Principal Gilando said earlier, one of the great things too about the realignment of the middle school and high school and the reimagined plan was we get to share teachers. So someone like Mr. Locatel, who is our engineering teacher, teaches seventh through 12th grade engineering. So that builds consistently see, throughout our program. Um, Ms. V, our TV media teacher, teaches eighth grade through 12th grade. So we worked with the staff in 2022, we came up with electives. Uh, the teachers were involved in the process of what electives would be beneficial to the students, what ones did we want to keep. In sixth and seventh grade, in the old model, the students were told what electives they were taking. In eighth grade, they had choice, so they ranked their electives from, I think, five, and they got to take two semester electives. So now we offer, um, I think seven, uh, no, uh, eight or ten electives in eighth grade. I don't remember off the top of my head. I apologize. But we do offer more diverse electives. Um, the revisions were made. We implemented them. We revised the curriculums over the summer for the courses that needed to have changes. This allows for more scheduling flexibility for the students. It allows the students to have more opportunities to see different areas that they may not have been able to see before. Um, and one example, which I think is great, is the growth in our band. Before this realignment, band was something that was taken as an add-on. You had to get pulled out of class to take band, whether it was for your music lessons or however, and we had fewer than 30 students in our middle school band. Two years in, we have more than 60 students now because band runs as a full year course, which the students have the option to take. Pushing that forward, that's gonna continue to grow not only our middle school band, but our high school band. So this is the start of a lot of what we're doing that will affect not only our middle school students, but what goes on 9 through 12. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone. I, I had a question, a quick question. So we, we 
ending year three, right? So, like, what are like, what are some of the next steps? Like, what do you what do you foresee? Do you foresee additional electives of subjects we're not teaching? Like, what what do you what do you need from us and the board in terms of going forward? I know that our program of studies is done in November, December, and voted on in January. But like, what, where, where do you see four or five years, four, five, and six for say? So two big areas I see are um, a second wave of electives in the middle school because we are also growing. So we have to look at class size. Um, some of our electives do have larger classes. So not only an addition of middle school electives, but the next step becomes reevaluating our high school electives. So we start with the middle school and we build up. We did an eighth grade TV elective. Last year we resequenced our high school TV media program. We started our seventh and eighth grade engineering electives. This summer, Mr. Locatell will be and I will be working together to write the three new engineering courses for the high school. So I think a big push that will be happening is um, increasing of some electives at the middle school and then the evaluation of the, middle, of the high school electives to see how we can build on what we're doing at the middle school to improve those. I, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. Thank you for this middle school reimagining plan. It was way overdue, and I know the benefits are tremendous for our students. So thank you, and just keep up the good work. Thanks. Mr. DeRosa, who won the basketball game between the students and the teachers? And, 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 and there is a right answer. Teachers. Oh, Mr. DeRosa. <laughs> Mr. DeRosa, the, I mean, it was, the climate and culture of the middle school is struggling right now. Mr. Dutzer was in the zone, and he just that was it? That was it. it. You know, yeah. um, he had quite a game, quite a player. Okay, well, that's fair. I mean, you know what? It, it you, did go into win, it, win at all costs. It was overtime. It was overtime? It was overtime. overtime. Given the opportunity. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Plump needs to be sidelined, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we do, uh, we do thank you for, for all, all that, that you've done over these past three years. I know Mr. DeRosa is new, new at, and I know that this is Mr. Orlando's first year, but um, we put a big emphasis, this is for the board and the community, but we put a big emphasis on teams. Um, and uh, I couldn't be happier with how they've, they've progressed these last couple of years. I couldn't be happier with the efforts of our team leaders and, and, and the stuff that we're getting out of that. At the end of the day, it's, it was, we continue to do what's best for kids and providing supports for, for kids. Um, I look forward to uh, continuing to grow the elective program and as it, as it feeds into the high school. I think I'm excited about that. Um, and, you, and I think for all of us, just seeing what was here tonight with robotics shows you the potential um, of being able to link the middle school and high school together and grow those programs. Um, shows that it was a... Uh, and that example was a great success. So thank you for coming out tonight, and thanks for kind of putting a bow on this, and, and onward. Thank, okay. you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you. I know I can definitely say that I'm appreciative of having watched each of these steps of the process go through the, um, the last couple of years. It's been interesting, so it's always nice to wrap up a project, so. Thank you. Uh, yes, it is. Um, can I have a motion to discuss uh, the resolution for the Administrative Professional Day? All right, Ms. Stevenson, seconded by Ms. Calvis. Um, and for the National Administrative <coughs> Professional Day of April 24th, 2024, um, if we all could um, just, in our usual fashion, just go around and, and read um, each grouping. Whereas administrative professionals are the backbone of the school and district, district organization, they are the link between parents, teachers, and administrators. And Whereas administrative professionals complete a variety of tasks, including accounting, scheduling appointments, maintaining administrative calendars, and caring for our st students and staff. They oh. maintain attendance records, answer the phone, pay the bills, and communicate with parents, community members, and staff. And Whereas administrative professionals ensure that school site and district staff have the information and materials to do their jobs effectively and? 
whereas administrative professionals are the face of the school and district and are usually the first contact that parents and community members have with our school district. It is through them that community members and parents form positive impressions of our schools and the work that is accomplished in the district and. Whereas administrative professionals keep pace with advances in computer, phone, and document reproduction technology in order to better perform their duties and. Whereas administrative professionals listen to students, parents, community members, as well as staff members and guide them in finding resolution to their concerns and. Whereas administrative professionals are the lifeblood of the everyday ebb and flow of activity in the school and district offices, administrators, teachers, other classified staff, students, parents, and community members depend on our administrative professionals on a daily basis. Be it resolved that the Glen Rock Board of Education recognizes and acknowledges the positive impact of <coughs> administrative professionals on our district. All right. May I have a motion to approve the resolution? Ms. Scarpelli, seconded by Mr. Corey. And if you are able to call roll, Mr. Canales? Yes. Ms. Carasola? Yes. Ms. Carr? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Scarpelli? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Ms. Rendell? Yes. Dr. Robinson? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, we need a motion to open our <coughs> public hearing on our energy savings obligation refunding um, school bonds. And uh, Mr. Con and, and then uh, once we have the motion, um, Mr. Canellis, are you able to tell us um, exactly why we need this public hearing? Can I have a motion? Ms. Scarpelli and Ms. Stevenson, second. So the public hearing is necessary uh, in order uh, to give the official authorization of, for the issuance of energy savings obligation refunding bonds that will pay for the upfront cost and installing of the energy conservation measures contemplated by the uh, ESIP that we have been talking about over the last few weeks, along with the associated professional fees. Once the public hear hearing is concluded, and assuming the board adopts the corresponding resolution, the board will be in a position to move forward with issuing the bonds. Um, this is just a necessary step. Uh, last meeting, we had our first reading of these ordinances. Now we will have the final reading of the ordinances. Um, and this will be followed by uh, a ratings call later this week, and then the actual sale of the bonds through uh, the Royal Bank of Canada, and uh, we should be off and running and closed by May, and then 18 months of uh, installation. All right. Thank you, Mr. Canales. All right. Uh, so public comments are to be on the energy savings obligation refunding uh, school bonds only. Uh, there will be a time later for additional public comments. Um, 758, if we can open public comments, please state your name. Your address. All right. Uh, it's 7.58. Um, we'll close public comments. Seeing no members of the public to make comments. Can I have a motion uh, to discuss the resolution B1? All right, Ms. Ms. Rundell, all right, seconded by Mr. Corey. Are there any um, comments from trustees or questions on B1? Ms. Scarpelli. A question, I just see in here there's a, a limit as to what the interest rate can be. So if it doesn't, if we can't issue these bonds at 5% or less, then this won't go through. Correct. And do we know when the bond first payment might occur or when are we trying to June. have that happen? Uh, as it stands right now, it is being uh, templated to be in July of 2025. Any additional comments? All right. Um, can I have a motion to approve the resolution B1? All right. Yes. Ms. Carousella and seconded by any second? 
Ms. Carr. Dr. Steven, uh, Robinson, we already have a motion on the floor. Okay. So then so uh, in terms of approving. Is, if we if we have no more dialogue, then we would just call the roll. Call roll. Okay. Thank you for no, that no worries. point of correction. Ms. Calvez. Yes. Ms. Carasola. Yes. Ms. Carr. Yes. Mr. Corey. Yes. Ms. Garpelli. Yes. Ms. Stevenson. Yes. Ms. Rundell. Yes. Dr. Robinson. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, Thank good. you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, again, so I'm actually going to ask Mr. Uh, McCory and Ms. Hoffensberger to come on up. We're going to kind of jump this a little bit, the agenda, just because they're the only two here. I don't want to keep them here forever. So, Rob, if you could have a seat where you were before, and Tara, I'll get a chair for you right here. For the members of the, of the public, uh, you, you, you are probably aware that the board has two goals for this year. One is centered on school uh, security, uh, security in general, and the other one is on, on communications. And so uh, Mr. McCory, who's our director of security, and Ms. Hoffensberger, who is our director of community relations, um, both have a couple of things to share. Mr. McCory um, will share very briefly uh, the, some of the findings from the security audit from a Porzio it was a company that the board contracted out with in the fall uh, and um, they gave us some recommendations clearly we cannot go into all the recommendations because they are security um, matters we did discuss some enclosed uh, Mr. McCory is going to give us just a very brief overview of some of those recommendations uh, things that we're going to kind of tackle in the next uh, couple year, a couple years, and some maybe even immediately. So, Mr. McCoy. Thank you very much. Uh, so, January 29th, January 30th, 2024, uh, Porzio Compliance Service conducted a site, a site assessment of the district school buildings. Um, as a result of that assessment, there are several recommendations that they've given us, mainly uh, a couple of points that I'll make is signage uh, for the perimeter, uh, increased signs indicating property boundaries and authorized access. Um, on the exterior, uh, increased signs to direct visitors for parking and access. One central entry point. Uh, our visitor management software, um, they recommended we increase the electronic visitor management system to include the elementary schools and that will be managed by security cameras additional cameras to be added to cover elementary hallways cover blind spots on the exterior our pa upgrade and after our security measures uh decreased building access to only those designated areas for after hours utilization and security personnel for additional events Thank you, Ms. Mr. Uh, McCory. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I know a lot of this went over in closed session, and we know that we can't share much in public, but we did want to share a little bit, and we do thank you for coming out and for all your work with school security and supporting the, the board's goal this year. So thank you. Thank you. And you are free to go unless you'd like to stay. You can go. Okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. And uh, Ms. Hoffensberger is here to talk a little bit about, and the board has this in backup, is a draft again we want to emphasize a draft of the community relations and communication plan which again is, a, is the second of the two board goals for the year uh, we're not going to go over all, all 12 pages but I think we'll go over some of, of the highlights and certainly would be happy to answer any questions that the, that the trustees have but I'm going to turn it over to Tara to do a little brief overview of your thoughts um, again this is a working document it's not a final document it's just a draft um, but we would like to get something finalized uh, either in May or in June so we can make sure that we uh, achieve this board goal this year with a really good comprehensive communication plan. So Tara, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> so as you all, I hope you had a chance to look at it, um, this plan was created to establish a clearly defined communications framework for the district in addition to supporting both the district's mission and the Board of Education goal for this school year. It's important to note that this plan is a working document that it will continuously evolve uh, to address any emerging needs or wants, and that includes making changes from any feedback um, or requested edits tonight. The plan will be utilized as a guide that both the district administration and uh, me, as the director of communications, will monitor and adjust as necessary. Um, I, I don't want to go through all 12 pages, like Dr. Charleston said, but uh, main outline is we go over the Glen Rock Public Schools mission statement in addition to some demographic information. Uh, we touch on all of our target audiences in the first section which is an outline of both um, internal and external stakeholders. We go over our communications channels, which are the primary channels uh, that we delve into for the bulk of this plan. We talk about every channel that I have found uh, that is utilized um, for any type of communications and community relations thus far. Um, an example of those, we go all the way from the website, social media, School Messenger Communicate, which is um, the messages and emergency communication system we use, email communications, Genesis, press releases, uh, the Glen Rock Board of Ed meeting highlights that Dr. Charleston sends out, uh, Glen Rock Media uh, that the students run, and Glen Rock TV, which is um, up for discussion as well. So again, that's the bulk of the plan to go through all of those uh, channels and how they are currently utilized and how we hope to continue to utilize them better in the future. <clears throat> the assessment of the current state is um, the next part of the plan, arguably one of the most important sections in my opinion as it explains the findings of the current community relations and communications functionalities within the district. Um, it can pinpoint and identify our strengths, weaknesses, gaps, needs, opportunities for improvement. And these findings are what helped us to establish the four primary goals for the plan. Um, those four goals, which are the rest of the plan, really what, what the whole um, plan is about to try to reach these goals. Number one is the board plan, I'm sorry, the board goal, which is to maintain a proactive media and community relations program to enhance the district's image on local, state, and national levels. Goal number two is to enhance Glen Rock Public Schools' digital profile, which includes mainly the website and social media. Number three is to modernize while maintaining traditional aspects of the district's visual and brand identity. And number four is to update and streamline a crisis communication plan for future use. So that's just a summary um, of this draft. Again, a work in progress, but a, um, a good start, in my opinion, to a comprehensive plan. It's, it touches on a lot. So the board has had this for a little while. Do you have any uh, questions or comments? Is when you made this goal, uh, Dr. Robinson, is this what the, the vision of the board was? Was this type of plan? Like, we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think Tara's done a nice job of putting something together um, as a good starting point for discussion. So the floor is the board's. Ms. Carousel. Thank you, Tara. I love this. It was very comprehensive. I just want to call out, I was really um, pleased to see the, um, when we talked about kind of the assessment, the acknowledgement that the district is not actively or successfully promoting all the amazing happenings within our schools. And I know these meetings, we are so exposed to all the greatness that's happening with you know, wrestling and robotics just tonight and even our young students that came by. But people don't know that externally, and I'm always, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not fighting for our schools to let them know that, but it kind of is a battle sometimes. Yep. So the fact that there's awareness of that and that yep. we're going to be tackling it is um, just really thrilled about that. Um, my only other comment about something to consider under the stakeholders, while not a stakeholder, I feel like people are always comparing us to surrounding um, schools. So I don't know if you'd want to add some kind of external... Kind of like our peer schools mm -hmm. or something like that, just as an awareness. I don't okay. know that we're marketing to them necessarily or communicating to them, but I know we get a lot of comparisons to them, so yep. maybe just awareness of them also being an external factor on things. Great. Thank you. But thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Carousel. Any other trustees? Okay. 
I know I can definitely say that um, looking at my Facebook feed, sometimes I'm, I'm noticing the Glen Rock schools popping up a bit more um, in, in the search. So I think that um, the proactiveness of, of the communication is definitely something that I visually notice. Uh, so I appreciate your efforts. Um, thank you. And that's it. So, Dr. Robinson, are you saying that before Tara got here, <laughs> that social media was not uh, as done as well as it is now? Uh, that is, is not that what I Ms. am referring to. Is but that actually, what you heard? I didn't hear yeah, that. Uh, it might have okay. Been. Just, just, just. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, it would I'm be offended and not hurt. No, the Facebook but. algorithm. That's my. <laughs> it's all algorithm. That's the answer. All right. Thank you. I will highlight that Tara's done two things in particular, she's done a lot of things, but the two things that I highlight are the press releases that you've seen. Mm -hmm. I think those are done very professionally, uh, very well, and highlight things that would not have happened um, if she wasn't here. Uh, I think the, the one you just did was on uh, Michelle, uh, maiden name is, is Costa, but like, that's something I would not have uh, put together, and that's out to the press, and it's on social media, so you're doing a really nice job of more formally recognizing our, our students. Um, even when they're recognized here at the board, we had our gold our gold star winners that had formal uh, press releases, so yeah. it, it's wonderful. And then the second piece, which I think the board may see soon, is the branding. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. So, um, you wanna share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so, we are working with a graphic designer. Um, my goal, as you'll see in number two, uh, I'm sorry, number three, is to not change, not come in and make major changes. The traditionalism of any brand is so important to me. It's so important to the town. It's so important to anyone who's ever gone through the Glen Rock Public School System. It needed to be cleaned up majorly, and that's on all, um, all schools, across all schools, and at the district level. And what I mean by cleaned up is um, high-res versions of these logos, having an official color of red, <laughs> um, what red sh should we use so that all the reds match um, when branding. And this will eventually lead to a style guide. That style guide will have all of the comprehensive um, looks of all of the logos with the correct colors. We are tweaking some to make them more uniform with the other ones. For example, across the elementary schools, I just want them to look a little closer to each other, keeping their school colors, keeping their mascots, um, everything that's there, having the full school name um, in the logo. Uh, a lot of the schools don't even have that. They'll just have, um, I don't know, just not the full, the Coleman, you know, and not Clara E. Coleman. Um, so, to me, it was in major need of a cleanup, but not big changes. It just, it'll be noticeable, but in hopefully all positive way. Um, and what those once those logos are done, which the first draft has been um, delivered to me, and I'm waiting to find a good time to meet with a branding committee that I've formed um, so to show them, and then I'll meet with all of the administrators. I hope that that will lead to some final edits. We have three rounds of edits, three rounds of edits for each logo. Um, those will eventually be put into a style guide with those colors, chosen fonts. Um, eventually that can lead to email signatures, which is a personal goal that I would love <laughs> across district um, to have everyone have coordinating uh, email signatures, that kind of thing. Um, things for business cards. Uh, fonts and colors and logos to use for that. So it'll just continue to grow and that style guide will continue to grow, but we needed a first point and uh, this is it. So we've, we've begun. Thank you. If I may, I would like to mention my favorite thing that she does are the board photos on the, on the <laughs> website. <laughs> where that she gets those photos, it's, just, it's something incredible something happening there. Something I'm not else. sure where she I gets know. it from. It's great it's, teamwork, that's yeah. what that is. <laughs> But your social media is not as good as it was. I just want to acknowledge that there is so much more positive press out there for us. So yeah. even seeing the Glenmark Gazette Friday morning on my driveway, seeing us positioned in a positive light and highlighting that. So I, I want to thank you for forming those relationships. Um, it's nice to have a positive front page, um, and we deserve it because there was so much good going on here. So thank you. No, I don't think I'm going to bring Tara back again. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, uh, Tara. Nice knowing you. Um, I could do this every Monday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? 
So I guess our plan, Tara, would be, do we want to have this finalized in the next month? The board no more comments outside of, of, of Ms. Carousel's comment. We could put that in and then maybe have another draft or a final draft, share it with the board. The board can not have you come to a meeting but can provide one last round of possible feedback and then we can finalize this and vote either at the second meeting in May or the second meeting in June. So yeah, we have, absolutely. and that way the board would have, would have achieved that goal for the year. Sound good? Thanks, Tara. Thanks for coming out. We appreciate it. Such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yes. We're really just on um, it's one personnel. Okay. So I'll try to go through through, through these uh, quick. Um, certainly happy to answer any questions and, and uh, entertain any any uh, discussions or comments. Uh, as the board's aware. Uh, in the budget for 24-25 for is a full-time art position. Um, and part of that was going to abolish the uh, existing part-time art teacher position. Because um, that's no longer needed because we're creating a full-time position. Um, the teacher that was currently uh, part-time has accepted the full -time, a full-time position. So no one's losing a job but the board would be required to abolish that part-time position because if you don't, then that position still is out there and someone would have claim to that. So on the next agenda, we will have a resolution to abolish a part-time teaching, teaching position. Okay. We have some job descriptions there. I won't go over them, uh, but I, it's my recommendation that we just abolish them. They're not needed. Um, they're unnecessary. Uh, so we don't have... Uh, Board of Ed or District Webmaster, that person just left, right? So there's no special position for that. The Board of Ed Communication Media Specialist, that person just left. She's the Director of Community Relations. And we don't have a supervisor of STEM or STEAM, which I think that was from 2013 or something like that. So we have no, no desire or anything to hire someone for that position. So I think it would be uh, good to clean up on our end, on the personnel side, but to abolish these, these job descriptions since we don't plan on filling those, mm -hmm. filling those in the future. So any comments or questions or concerns about that? Ms. Carousel? I like the word sunset versus abolish. Okay. <laughs> we will say sunset, but the resolution will read abolish. <laughs> um, but yes, yes, we can let them, they will go quietly into the night. Uh, so those will be the four personnel resolutions outside of any new hires or retirements or things like that. On our next agenda. On our next agenda. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. okay. Into the general section with policy. So for policy, um, we didn't have any new updates from Strauss Esme, but it, I, in, in thinking about wanting to make sure that we continue to discuss uh, policy, because that's really one of the main functions of the board, right? Is to is to set policy. I put these three policies on there just for review. And then any uh, changes, if you if you think about it, if you think that there should be changes to them, the first one is the activity participation, which I know everything says that it was done when we switched over to Strauss Estimate in 2020. But our understanding is the activity participation came out of when uh, Governor Christie made all those changes, and the board was really trying to get money for uh, because the surplus was taken away. That's back when the board like privatized the the. the, the the paraprofessionals and the custodians and, and, and instituted this um, activity fee for middle school and high school for sports and clubs. Um, and I'm totally not saying to get rid of it. I'm just saying it's been that way since I be we believe 2011. Mm -hmm. So does the board want to continue that? Do you want to continue at that rate? Do you want to make changes? That's why I put this policy on there. Um, if the board didn't want to do anything, then what we would say would be reaffirmed on April 8th, 2024, so that way people can say, when they look at the policy, wait, the board looked at this, they discussed it, and they want to keep it as is, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so uh, I, th I thought I'd put it on there. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, I just think that we probably should clean up some of this because it does talk about the acceptance of checks, and I think we're getting away from, or trying to get away from the acceptance of checks for the payments of, I know it's, uh, athletics is definitely credit card, and I thought um, 
you know, any the activity fee, possibly middle school. I'm not sure how that collection is being handled. But um, anyway, I just thought I'd mention that, that, that part of that. If Thank I may, Dr. Them. Charleston, please. Um, so the policy is currently being looked at by our athletic director and dean to make sure that we are, um, in fact, doing what the policy says. Mm -hmm. um, so once this comes back, it'll come back uh, with the appropriate uh, procedure that is currently taking place, which you are correct, does not include checks. And the only thing I would add to what Dr. Charleston said, that if you were to decide to, to, to abolish the fees, that would obviously not be for the 24-25 school year. That would be for the 25-26 school year. Correct, because we have already budget anticipated revenue from that. And I'm not advocating to abolish it. The, the question is, do you want to change those numbers is really what, what you know, I don't know if that's high, if that's low. Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I know that when my daughter <laughs> plays softball, it's like $3,000, right, for a season. So I'm not saying to do that, but these are, are, are not extreme amounts. It could be for, for certain people, so that's up to you if you want to change it. You want to keep it for sports and get rid of it for clubs. You want to add more. You want to do this. That. That's kind of where I put this on there. Um, and, again, I'm not advocating for anything. Keep it the same way. I just think the idea that the board had a discussion and we reaffirm it is, is a home run for us. Understood. I, I do have a question, um, and maybe that can also come out of the responses of the board. Um, what kind of feedback over the years have we received regarding the um, these participation fees? Um, and, okay, so none maybe, um, or any hardships. Okay, thank you. Ms. Ms. Carr, or was yeah, it Ms. Stevens? No, okay. Yeah. I, um, well, I was never fully supportive of, of it. I did support it, um, but I'm not in support of adjusting, amending. I would just recommend Reaffirm. that we keep it at the same amount. Uh, I think at this point, every student who enters this district knows that when they get to middle school, high school, that there's going to be an activity fee. So to abolish it now, sunset it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not supporting, but I don't agree with any price change, cost change, so. Okay. Did you have something, Ms. Stevenson? Did you? No, you were asking, like, for feedback. I don't yeah. really think there's not yeah. much, but I, I did like the uh, max that you pay, because third sport was free. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> then that's helpful, um, because some kids do do three sports, and it can add up, especially if you have more than one child doing something. But, you know, I just think everybody, as Liz said, when they first started, there was a big controversy oh, yeah, over it. But huge. I think everybody understands now, it's just, it is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Carpelli. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine if we keep the fee as it is. I would not recommend abolishing any of these fees. Um, we are going to have budget issues going forward. So I don't think we should eliminate other streams of revenue, that's my opinion. What I really would like to see is the activity fee. We completely 100% collect the athletic fee without a problem, but the co-curricular club fee I don't think is being co collected as accurately as it could be. So I would love to see what those revenue numbers could potentially actually be for us before we can even adjust these numbers at all. So I, and I know it's been difficult in the past on figuring that out. I think there's got to be some kind of mechanism we can put into place to make it fair. And the reason why I do think we should keep it is because there are some clubs that actually take more time and energy, or just as much time and energy, the one that was here today, um, than sports do. So, you know, and they do travel. and they, So I do think it's, it's unfair that only the sports is really the one that's being collected accurately. Thank you. All right. Dr. Jackson. So we'll say we're going to reaffirm that, and we'll yes. revisit the checks and revisit how uh, we'll provide more information on the collection process for the co-curriculars. Um, but, and that's what it'll, okay, good, 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 good. All right, the next one is timely because we're about to assign, come on, we're about to assign students. This is not working here. <coughs> there we go. my spot there it is 
So 5120 is the assignment of students. And, and the big thing is that you don't have neighborhood schools anymore. You haven't had it for years. Um, but, uh, you know, once the students are assigned, um, they're in that school, and then anyone else that moves in uh, goes to the school with the lowest uh, uh, enrollment. And that's, that's worked, but every year, and we're next week we assign the kindergarten students, which, by the way, we're at 161 today. Um, and for, if you're curious, uh, we were at, I think, 138 at this time last year. So when we did the, what we call the, the initial, initial signing. So um, the question for the board, I think, on this policy, and it could, you may have other questions, but it's really the attendance zone. Does the board want to continue with one, the district is one zone, and then we assign students not on proximity, but on class size. Outside of the kindergartners that come in, we try to assign them to their neighborhood schools or with their siblings. We follow this policy to the letter. Um, but just so the board's aware, we do get many complaints uh, when people move in and move in next to Coleman and have to go to Bird. Like, it's, it's, it's relentless, which is fine. We deal with it. But in, clar in clarification, though, that's after Kindergarten, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I'm asking because I want it publicly said. I mean, we do our best. You do yes. our you So the kindergartners, 161 students. We might get a couple of more when we do it next week. Let's just say we have 170 by next week when we meet. We will do the best we can to do it by neighborhood. Certainly siblings go to where their siblings are, easy peasy. And then we go based on neighbors. What you have happen every year is that someone on the same street goes to Central and Coleman. And that's where we get the pushback from. Or when they move into the district, um, they uh, uh, move next to Coleman and, again, are sent to Bird or Hamilton. And in their mind, it doesn't make sense. And I get that. But the policy, I enforce policy. So I just want to make sure that the board is still comfortable with, with that. And this policy goes along with the other one, because the other one's assignment of students, too. And I'm going to listen. I set the plug in my computer. It died. Just, um, I don't know if it would be helpful to us, but maybe reinforce with the real estate agents on how this too. works, because they may not know, thinking, okay, it's neighborhood schools, they may not know what our policy is, so just that, so that the real estate agents have the information, that they can share it then with their clients, so this wouldn't perhaps not be such a big surprise to them or cause a lot of angst. Just like, like a warning, oh, by the way, if, the, you know, if this... This might be your school, but if the enrollment is high, you'll be placed at the school with the lowest enrollment. That's interesting. How, I guess, going through that, would we then look at just the real estate agents that are typically the, the big ones for, for, you know, like, how do we get the obscure? Right, I mean, I... How about a press release? Yeah, I was say, <laughs> maybe Tara could send something out to, to the real estate agents the places in t like that serve Glen Rock, like the ones in Glen Rock, Ridgewood, or, you know, they, I'm or sure. Just the big or the big, like the big ones, like the Weikert or yeah. Keller Williams or whatever they are, just to reach as many people as possible. Obviously, we're not going to reach them all. I don't think that's realistic. But I think if we just kind of advocate that out there so that they know it when someone's someone buying a house, that this may be a possibility. And is there a way um, on our website, like, because I would assume that if somebody was moving into the district, they would be looking at the website to see what, you know, like about the different schools or like what are the schools or that, what's the closest school. Like sometimes there's like a, maybe even just in, you know, your common, you know, buying, selling time, you would have like something like hot item, move, uh, you know, moving into the district, this, you know, take a look at our policy. Just kind of like a. I, th I think that's a good idea. Highlight. But also, yeah, with the reach out. I mean, it, both, I think, would be a comprehensive look at it. Okay. I don't. Yes, yes, we can. We certainly can can do that. I guess Tara to reach out. I, I believe. Again, we can't speak for all agents, but I believe that they're pretty forthcoming with them because when the parents say, "Oh yeah, we knew, but we were hoping that I could I live next to Coleman. Why would why you know, why would you assign me to Hamilton? Like I live right there. I could see Coleman. That doesn't make any sense to me." And so. And that's fine. Like we do our job, and it doesn't make its way to you. And, and that's, and that's, but it, it does cause some consternation. So I, I think it's just important if the board reaffirms that, mm -hmm. it gives us more, more support. When I can say, hey, the board just talked about this on April 8th, and they reaffirmed that this is the policy, this is what the, how they want students assigned. It's fine. Yeah. 
I can totally say fine. I don't think that there's any more fair way than the way that it's been ex expressed in the policy. I'm comfortable reaffirming. I just have one question. So when someone moves to the district, they're going in the, the elementary school age, they're going to the school that has the lowest enrollment for that grade, right? Um, but could there be some kind of ratio, like say maybe Hamilton just has 18 and that's technically the lowest, but Coleman has 19 and they live like next to Coleman. Could there be some kind of maybe policy adjustment that there's, I don't know if ratio is the right word, Sharon, help me. It's, it's not cap. Least, but like. No, I understand your question, like, and, and I get it. Like, listen, there's 18 at Hamilton and if I put you at Coleman, there's going to be 20 at Coleman. What's the big deal? Like one more kid, like versus having 19 at Cal Hamilton and 19 at Coleman. For the second I deviate from that, it's over. Right? That's what I mean, if there was enough, if the policy had some kind of ratio, if, I don't know, if it wasn't so drastic of a change, I didn't know if it was so, possible. So, uh, you missed Carr. Oh, wait. So, that, so like that, that's basically my thought. Um, would that be amending the policy? It would be. So, I'm kind of leaning towards that. Sharon just had a good point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think going back years ago, I, I thought any policy could have changed between way back when, when I had a kindergartner. Um, but I thought the policy was that when the class size reached a max at that elementary, that was it. So the max was, I think our max is 25. But if, and once they reach that, then there's no room at Bird. You got to go to whichever one has the lowest. So, so that's not how the policy time. reads, right? Maybe it was tweaked prior to, to me getting here. Or maybe, maybe they, they ignored it yeah. um, and went the, paths, the, the path of, of least resistance yeah. from the parents. Yeah. Um, I will share that. I don't think it's that, that would not be fair to, to the students or the teachers, right, mm -hmm. that, that you have 17 at Hamilton, but because Bird hasn't hit 25 yet, you're going to funnel all the kids until they hit 25. That's a big difference between 25 in one school and 17 in another versus, was it 20 and 20, if you did it like that. Um, and you know that we have gotten some complaints from one of the elementary schools for the, the, the one grade, which is at 25, and one section of 26. So um, it's up to the board. Like, assigning kids, students is easy as long as we have a, 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 a map to follow. So the board just has to make that decision. And maybe not tonight's that, maybe it's something to think about in, in the future. It's maybe it's something to think about if for next year, right, when we get, get, get to that point. But, you know. Ms. Rundell. I just, I agree with Dr. Strauss. I think that it's our job as a Board of Education to make sure we have like an equitable education for all the kids. So to sort of him and haw on that, I think the policy is written correctly and it, it does allow for that more than it does. Because what if there was seven kids that came in and they all wanted to go there and you could only put three in? How do you decide that? I think distributing them to be the most equitable is our job and that's what we should hold to. Thank you, Ms. Um, oh, yes, Mr. Corey. The, the answer might simply be instead of 25, make it 22. Because if you have seven coming in the same week, that's that's that would be a tough challenge, but then you'd hit that cap at a certain point. I think the the challenge of a town like Glenrock, when it's you're thinking about the people that are moving here, they're looking for walkability, and that's not really a thing that we have except for the elementary school experience. So it's a careful balance of people that are really attracted to this town coming from New York City and the outer boroughs, Hoboken, Jersey City, and they they may be looking at buying their second family car. And it's just, it's part of the consideration of why they move out here because of that, you know, that walkability score. I'm just looking it up, 65 out of 100 sounds like a almost D plus for the town. And it's something that, that the schools could, perhaps we tweak that uh, and instead of having a cap. 25 is a lot of, a lot of students in elementary classroom. 18 does feel empty. And it's, it's a tough balance. I'm sure in five years we'll have different class sizes and that, that board at that time will be looking at a different kind of ratio, maybe overcrowding at that point in difference. But I think for the next couple of years, there's that, that timeline of where we're trying to fill more empty classrooms. So it's, it, it could be the right policy for us to consider a, a, just a lower cap and 
make it more neighborhood focused. Okay. All right. I guess, well, considering that cap, um, Dr. Charleston, how would something like that theoretically even work? Like, do we have any, like, what are some of the ratios or, you know, the student-teacher ratios that we have in, in, within the elementary schools? Like, I don't know, choose any, like, a, any random grade in, like, Bird or Central. <coughs> do we already hit that number? That yeah, grade? so Hamilton obviously is the small, smallest because of creating the four additional sections. Mm -hmm. So that's two, three, so grades two through five at Hamilton are, are small. Your kindergartens are averaging 18 across the district because next year those kids will come in the first grade and so first grade will have over 20 across the board. And then you're just growing, right? So the ones that have the 10 sections um, uh, across, there, once, once you're able to, to what am I, what's the word I wanna use? Once Hamilton is flushed out and then we're starting to assign kids, like this group here, these 161 kindergartners will be spread out. Um, I think you'll be able to keep class sizes in that 18 to 21 range mm -hmm. unless enrollment, enrollment just explodes. Um, without that, then, then you're looking at class size like you have at certain, certain schools, 25, 26 kids. Um, I think it's hard if we were to put a number that says we're going to funnel kids to their closest school um, until it hits a number, I'll say 22, and then we go with lowest enrollment. So the question becomes, is that by neighborhood or by as the crow flies, right? Is it miles? Is it steps? Am I, that's, that's silly. Is it quarter miles? Is it a neighborhood? Is it streets? Are you going to draw a map and say, if you live here and there's less than 22 kids in grade two and you are just moved here from Ridgewood, you're going to go to Bird because you live in that area, even though every other school in the second grade has 18 kids and now Bird's going to have 22. Is that what we want? That's fine, but you have to define that. Can't, I don't, so you need to get, then you might go back to like a neighborhood school type of thing or at least some mechanism where <clears throat> we, when we assign students, know that when you live there, you're going to bird if it's below that number. Make sense? Mm -hmm. so. It is. Ms. Carr? Is there any way to, um, I see that it says it was adopted in 2020. Is that because that's when you switched over to Strauss Estimate? Yeah. Okay, um, when you, it was switched over, were there changes made to the policy? Is there any way that we can get an old policy to hmm. see what the I can check. I don't know. I, I didn't make any changes okay. to it, but I'll check. I don't know if we have access to school boards or old policies, but we'll look. We'll look. Okay, because yeah. otherwise Rona would probably have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, I, yeah, I just. I mean, I think the policy should do what is going to be the best for best for the students, but also easy, you know, workable for the administration. I mean, in an ideal world, all class sizes will be even, right, mm -hmm. for teachers. But it isn't perfect world. So, and that's why we have in there that there can be exceptions made. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to leave it up to the administration to do what's best for our kids and assign the classes that they think are appropriate, but I think to hold fast to say if we have 180 kids, there should be 18 kids in every single class across the district is, is not 100% accurate too, right? Because if I live right next to Bird School and there's 18 kids in every class, you know, you've inconvenienced me sending me to Coleman or wherever it might be to make me the 18th kid there too. So there has to be some kind of wiggle room within this, mm -hmm. but I'm going to leave it up to the administration to do what they feel is best for our students. And if this policy written this way gives you that leeway to do what's best, and right, then I, I'm not going to strap you into certain protocols. So I'd like to go on the record that I hate number 10 on the policy. Yeah, that the superintendent can make exceptions to this policy because that's what comes across all the time and they, they have reasons. So I don't like number 10. I think we should take it out. Um, but uh, I don't, I have not ever made an exception because yeah. I feel that once I do that, it's over. And, and I get it, and I feel bad for people. So we put them on waiting lists, and we do a much better job with our central registrar and rate waiting lists. We have gotten kids off of the waiting list to go to the district that they want to. But to be honest with you, 8 out of 10 want to stay where they're at because they're used to it, they like it, they're happy there. 
they realize it's not as big a deal to go an extra quarter mile to the school. Um, so, how, how do the waiting lists work? So the waiting list, uh, we, we keep it separate. So when a parent, forget about kindergarten, so when someone moves in in, in October and, say, and they have a second and fifth grade or whatever, um, and they're going to be assigned to Hamilton, but they're like, I really want to go to Bird. My great-grandmother went, to, whatever, I want to go to Bird. Okay, we'll put you on the waiting list. And what happens is students can move out and it creates a spot. And once it creates a spot where Bird now has the lowest class size where we can then move somebody, we go to the waiting list and do that. Yeah. Okay. We don't have a huge waiting list. Um, and once they're asked if they want to leave, if they say no, then they're taken off the waiting list and they remain where they're at. And you might, be, you might um, recall that we offered to move students from one of the elementary schools that had bigger class sizes mm -hmm. to go to Hamilton, which was very small. Um, because of the added sections, and no one took us up on that. All right, now those class sizes in Hamilton are 17, 18, versus the 25 in the other school, so that definitely would have lowered it, lowered it down. Um, so I think people have become accustomed to their school, and they're okay, it's just the initial, I don't want to go there because I'm closer to this one, or I think that school's better. That's a good one too, right? That school has higher test scores, a higher ranking. So we get that, that, that as well. I'm okay with the policy as, 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 as is. I just wanted to make sure the board is okay with how we assign students. And if you want to tweak them, certainly we could, we could enforce anything. Um, so maybe something to think about. Yeah. And we can bring it up again at, at a future. It's not going to affect next week when we do the kindergartners. But maybe something we can talk about next fall or something that we could implement later on. And okay. we could chew on it some more and then maybe look at other districts and see how they assign assign kids and so on. Does that work? I, I fully support keeping 10 all the way at the bottom of the list. No. So <laughs> keep well, we it. want it in bold, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> it, if we get to 10, that means 1 through 9 didn't function properly. So it, it's the right where it if, needs to be. If anybody would like um, at a future time to bring it up for a future year, then um, please just send me an email and we'll look over the course of the year where we can put this in for uh, another review. Okay. Well, it's okay. We'll just say reaffirmed for both of them because the other one's the same. It's just assigning the students, yeah. and then we'll but we'll revisit it in the in the future, um, happily, mm -hmm. and we'll see if we can find the old one from school boards. Would that update the date, that update the date as uh, Ms. Carr pointed out? Then so it, okay, it would be the same policy, but then refreshed as it'll say reaffirmed before. tonight. Yeah. 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 Ms. Carr, um, just a suggestion. Just a suggestion, um, and it doesn't have to be done now because the lights haven't been put on the lower field yet, but I think we need to revisit the light policy and the cost when we put those lights there. Um, and the, the, the time, we took away the time constraints at the upper field, but now that we'll have two, we might want to revisit Sounds the good. lighting. Yeah. yeah, when James goes over his report tonight, we'll get an idea of lights. Lights are looking after Christmas, so we have time. Thank you. We're good for that. On to no items for governance. Um, instruction and program. All right, Mr. Rennes. All right. Um, so the few things that I wanted to just talk through today, I, I think I mentioned recently that I was going to give you a, a brief update on the phonics pilot that we're doing. We're going to have a complete presentation on this next month at the Cow that the elementary principals, the literacy coach, the English supervisor will be here to do. Um, but I wanted to kind of fill you in on, on kind of where, where we are in this. So th the conversation with, with Phonics started last January, actually, initial principal discussions with the principals and the literacy coach and, and the supervisor and me. Um, and the real kind of um, purpose of those conversations is we felt that we needed a more cohesive research-based phonics program across all four schools, so especially in the primary grades, but later grades as well. And so we've started looking into it. I know that you, you know this because you approved the pilot programs. Um, back in September, the pilot programs were chosen and ordered. The teachers, there are eight of them piloting the program right now, two in each of the four buildings. 
and they received professional development in November, December, and they started working with their students in January. So I've been talking with a couple of the teachers. The team is meeting, I think, next week to start talking about kind of final plans. They, they looked before they chose these two programs at a bunch. Uh, foundations, Hegarty, 95% group, Spellography, from Phonics to Reading, Sonday, Phonics First were some of the ones they considered. And they, they landed on trying out Sonday and Phonics First. So there are um, two teachers in each building, one doing Sonday, one doing Phonics First. And they've been kind of corresponding and visiting each other and having conversations about that. Uh, Sonday is an Orton-Gillingham-based, multi-century strategies are built in. The teachers really liked the scope and sequence and the lesson plan structure. Um, the lessons are available fully online, so it's on a, on a projected screen and it kind of goes through. Um, pro professional development is required to use it, and it's, it's a full day of professional development from Sonday folks, the staff there. So they did that. The other one that, that you're going to hear about next month is Phonics First. It's also multi-sensory based, systemic, it's structured, sequential, phonics-based direct instruction approach to teaching, beginning, at risk, struggling, learning, disabled, dyslexic, ELL reader, I mean they've got it all in there. Um, it's a bit more all-inclusive than the Sunday one, um, but a lot more pieces to manage, like physical pieces. Um, so they're going to talk more about that. Um, the teachers I've talked to like like both programs, they really do like them. Um, they like the multi-sensory emphasis as well as the professional development provided. Uh, one of the teachers I talked to has been teaching 20 years, 23 years, something like that, and she said she learned all sorts of really great stuff, not just with, about the program, but about, about the fundamentals of teaching reading that, that the new research has, which is great. Um, so that was, that was nice to hear. But it is 30 hours of self-paced videos of training, which is, which is a lot, right? It's a lot to ask of, of all of our teachers to do. So it's, it's something that, that is, is, is happening there. So they're meeting in the next week or two. I think they're meeting actually Wednesday this week and then they have a follow-up one. But they're gonna be putting together a presentation for you for next week. Um, these, are, these are the experts in the field. You know, I was a high school English teacher. I'm not, I'm not trained in phonics, right? So I, I understand the bits and pieces. I've, I've attended some of the classes. I know some of the, what's going on here. But we're gonna get them here. Um, I've told them from the beginning, like, I support this, absolutely. Let's move where we wanna go, and I, I trust their expertise. So uh, be, be ready for that, that next time. So I just want you to kind of get an idea of where we're going with that. Questions about phonics? You'll hear a lot more next month. All right, second thing on instruction and program is math textbook selection. So last year, I think it was Ms. Pelli who asked, does this mean next year we're gonna have more math books? And I said, I said yes, we are gonna have more math books. So um, Mr. Cusack was here earlier talking about changing of the math progressions for middle school. And what followed was a new textbook selection for middle school math and algebra one. And then last year, we went through the process to look at um, geometry and algebra two, and next in line now is pre-calculus. And so, so why? Like the, the real purpose is, is why are we doing this? And the first is that we are updating the math texts to, to make sure we're meeting the state standards on, on math. There are new ones that have to be, new standards that have to be implemented this September. Um, so we've been preemptively getting ready for that. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. The other reason is that Actually, this year it's available, but we're planning to implement it next year from the program of studies, you probably remember this. Um, the College Board is offering AP pre-calculus, and so we needed a pre-calculus book that aligns to the AP curriculum that College Board sets. So, um, so those are the, the main things driving it, but also we wanted to make sure that these texts, you know, kind of pick up where the Algebra 2 left off and get us to the calculus that we're going to. Um, so the timeline of this was, um, Ms. Della Fortuna met with, she had a committee of four. So Ms. Bukar, Mr. Weinberg, Ms. Nordman, Ms. Wallace, they are all teachers of pre-calculus right now, and some of them teach algebra two, and some of them teach calculus. So they kind of have the, the ends covered there as well. <clears throat> From January through March, they reviewed textbooks, um, a bunch of them actually. Um, Pearson had five different books, Cengage had four, McGraw-Hill, Wiley, Kendall Hunt, they looked at a lot of different texts here. And they narrowed it down to the top four. In March they brought that presentation, which you have in backup, to the math department. And, um, and they, they were able to look at the work that they had worked at, and they chose the text. And, and so what they're recommending is 
Um, a book from Pearson, both of them are Pearson products actually. One of them is called AP Precalculus, Graphical, Numerical, and Algebraic in the AP edition. So it's right on the title, AP edition. And then the other one is honor, for the Honors Precalculus and the Precalculus class is, uh, is one by Pearson. It's, it's the author I think is Blitzer on here. So you're going to be seeing both of these for uh, approval next meeting on the 29th. But I wanted to share this with you, the process, and then you have in backup um, what why, why they chose these things. Questions about math? So does that mean we're gonna be having a pre -cal, AP pre-cal class? Yes, so um, we have it in the program of studies for next year, and um, I, I, think, I think folks are gonna like it. You know, I think people are gonna sign up for it. Um, I thought you were gonna ask the next question, which is, does this mean next year we're gonna look at the calculus books? <laughs> I'm not sure if we're gonna look at the calculus books next year. I need to talk to Michelle about that photo. Yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, the last one is a little bit bigger. So I, I've been mentioning this kind of off and on for, for the last kind of few presentations, talking about how we're looking at, um, today we wrapped up the middle school uh, reimagined plan. We've been talking a lot about assessment. We've been talking a lot about a lot of these things. And um, Keith, if you would go ahead and bring out that, that diagram that I have. Here we go. So the state uses the term multi-tiered system of supports, MTSS, and they have this lovely graphic that is up on the, on the board behind me, which I think is actually really instructive. So what we've been doing over the last few years is, you know, our district goal is about assessment of student learning with the goal of providing responsive instruction. This year it's about in responsive instruction to meet individual student needs, differentiate instruction, personalized learning. This year, administratively, we've been really looking at what they call these multi-tiered systems of supports. So what we do, and, and you've heard me present data, you've heard me talk about other things here, we do really well with most of our kids, achieving very well, right? Our test scores are very strong, it's great. We're doing really good work. But where we have some work to do is on the edges, right? So the kids who are struggling, the kids who are um, needing additional support, and also the kids on the other end, the, the gifted and talented kids, right? We have a gifted and talented program, we have enrichment, we have things like that. But I think that there's room for us to do better on those edges, is, is where I think we, we could get a lot out of this. And so when we look at those systems of support, this framework here kind of helps us understand and look at it like a road map. Where, where are we doing well, where could we where'd beef it up? So, Basically, a state describes this as a framework for supporting students through a continuum of services provided through core programs and interventions. The use of data to drive decisions based on the intervention referral system. The framework provides schools with a structure to meet, for meeting the academic, behavioral, health, enrichment, social, emotional needs of all students. And it aligns resources from within, in the schools, across the schools, and within communities and counties to provide the right interventions to the right students at the right time. So if you think about the work that we've been doing, middle school reimagine, culture and climate, all of the, the bigger kinds of pieces that we've been working on for the four years I've been here, for the five years he's been here, um, a lot of that goes in this red triangle that you see there, right? Which is district and school leadership, which is family and community engagement, which is positive school culture and climate. And that's where we've been doing a lot of work. We've been doing a lot of work academically with looking at assessments, looking at how we use data, looking at how we track that, looking at subgroups. You've heard me talk about all these things many times. And so what we need to, what we're starting to look at are the, the things in the blue triangle, right? And so the blue inner triangle is the core instruction and the support surface specific skills. So core instruction, we're doing things like really looking at our standards based instruction, we're looking at assessments, we're looking at new textbooks, we're looking at all the things that you've heard me talk about many times. And now we're starting to look really kind of closely at these um, supports for specific skills. And so um, those tiers, as they call them in the middle, tier one is universal supports for all students. What are we doing in every class? As a classroom teacher, my job isn't to just stand there and lecture about the great Gatsby, right? My, my job is to help you if you're struggling, help you and find you and, and support you, right, in class. Not, oh, oh, well, you're just struggling, go figure it out yourself. Or you need to be referred out, or you need to get special service, or whatever. But tier one is, is my job in the classroom. What do I do to help all of my students today? And that should work for, you know, 80% of the students or so. 
But when students are struggling more than what I can do as a teacher in class, we move towards tier two. So this is targeted, this is small group interventions. We see this much more frequently in elementary schools, basic skills instruction, the BSI math, the BSA literacy. We see, we see that more fluidly happening in, in, um, in the elementary level. But we see that more maybe behaviorally in the middle school and high school. We have the core team, we have the INRS, we have uh, what Ms. Uh, Ms. Gerlando was talking about with, with all of the supports that are happening there um, in these small group I in interventions. And then for, for a smaller group of students that need it, we have much more intensive interventions. These are, you know, you would see pull out uh, resource room classes, you would see identification and classification, those kinds of things for students. So it's, it's really intense. And we do a lot of these things well. We do a lot of these things very well. But I think there's room for improvement to make it more systematized and more visible and more supported in, in, in our school. So when we go through this, which is what we're doing now, looking at this blue piece, how do we make sure that everybody's getting what they need when they need it? How do we make it so that kids can move in and out of these tiers of support fluidly, right? That I'm not a tier two kid the rest of my life, right, right, right now I need this support. And then once I've met these goals or benchmarks, then I'm out of it. And then if I have to come back, I'm back in. And to do that, we need data. We need to assess where they are. We need to understand what's, what's going on. And, and we do that. We do that well, but not consistently well and not consistent across all of the buildings, right? There, there's room to, to improve that. So what I'm leading right now are, are conversations that are about how do we systematize this and make it more universal and, and more robust for our students. This is, Dr. Charleston and I have talked about this, this is gonna be a multi-years long process. Right? This is not going to be a, a quick fix. We're going to change things for September, and then it's great. We move along. It's going to be how do, we, how do we value what we have already, and where do we build? Right? And so the process that I'm, I'm using right now to, to work through this with the administrative team, and they're starting to work with their staff, is, is a process called appreciative inquiry. And Keith, could you move to the next one, please? So the, the appreciative inquiry cycle is a, is a change initiative that's based on uh, what we're doing well, right? How do we start with what are we doing well? It's, um, it's a strength-based approach to analyzing our current system. It's, again, what are we doing well? How do we get more of it? How do we systematize it? How do we make sure that it's going well all over the place, right? This third grade teacher is doing a great job. Are all of the third grade teachers? How can we learn from each other? How can we support one another? How can we work as a team? So the appreciative inquiry cycle <clears throat> is kind of five stages, really kind of four once you define things. So starting off with definition, so we've been having meetings at our administrative council and separate smaller meetings about what is MTSS, what are interventions, what are they, where are they, what are we finding, what do we, what do we have, like take an inventory. Um, and then we spent some time on the discovery phase. What gives life? What is, you know, the best of what is? Um, what do we appreciate about what we're doing well here? I think too often, as, as a teacher, I felt this many times, um, administrators would come in and say, hey, this is the next best thing since sliced bread, we're gonna do this, move forward, let's go. And without pausing to say, but, but what is already working, right? Let's not throw away the good things that we have, let's build on them, let's, let's make them better. So we've been doing, I've been leading conversations with those and with, with that, dis, that discovery lens. And my administrators then reached out into their departments, their buildings, their, their faculty to start gathering information. What do we like? Excuse me. What's going well? What, what is precious, right? What is really important here? And we're just starting to move into the dream phase, <clears throat> which is this idea of what might be. What is the world calling for? This is about envisioning. This is about where do we want to go. It's about the dreaming. Like, if, if we could have anything we wanted, what would it be, right? And so we're starting those conversations now. Ultimately, we're going to move to design and destiny. Design is, okay, now that we have an idea of where we want to go, let's plan it out. Let's plan the first steps. Let's plan what needs to stay the same, what needs to change, what can we build on, and then, and then the destiny is kind of how do we sustain it? How do we continue learning from one another and, and continue the cycle? So since March, we've been working on discovery. What are we doing well? What are our strengths? What do we like about our systems of supports? And um, the, the results so far are 
teams, teams of people. Um, you heard Mr. DeRosa talk about the, the middle school teams, but also my administrators are talking a lot about their INRS teams, they're talking about grade level teams, they're talking about departmental teams. Um, that communication is really strong between a lot of our faculty members and our, our support, you know, the CST staff and, and folks like that. We have systems in place. Um, many of us have been in other districts where the systems are a little bit broken, right? And that's, that's not the case here. Um, they are here. Uh, we do a nice job with identification and using data, um, especially identification for, for child study team referrals. Um, we do a, a nice job progress monitoring, especially as part of the IEP process. That is very data driven and, and making sure that we're following up with students. Um, we have a lot of resources in this district and a lot of knowledge, a lot of qualified and appropriately trained educators. Uh, we're really proud of that. We, it's, it's one of the, the best things that we have here. And, um, and we also have enrichment and acceleration programs that are, that are something that we're proud of as well. So we're, like I said, we're moving into this dreaming phase to designing, from major dreaming to designing. What do we want these systems of support to look like in five years? What do we want students to feel? What do we want parents to feel? What do we want staff to feel um, about our programs? What steps do we need to take now to move in that direction? And once these kind of structures are addressed, how do we co-construct together a, a MPSS program that, that continues to build and, and, and maximize our resources? And, and that's the conversation I keep having, is that we have a lot of really good things happening. How do we maximize it, right? How do we, how do we celebrate it and maximize it and move it forward? So I'm really trying to phrase these conversations in terms of appreciative inquiry, right, about strengths-based thing. It's so easy to start pointing a finger, well, that's not good, or this, or we, but what, what is good? Let's start there, and let's get, let's get more of that. So you're going to hear more from me probably next month as these con conversations continue about what are some recommendations we have for, for next steps. Um, but I wanted to get you up to speed of where we are and what we're doing, and also getting feedback from you. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Vindas. Um, I know I, I specifically have a question with regards to the tier system. So the way that you um, described it in that picture, it, like would you have a, gen ed, a gen, general education student that would move between those you know, three tiers without necessarily being referred to special <coughs> education or is it? It's a good question. When you get up towards tier three, you're probably a classified student at that point. Right, and those are a little less fluid as far as those things, but, but not always, right? Some, when we talk about least restrictive environment, um, you are in the gen ed class as much as possible, right? And you're, you're pulled out for a resource, you're pulled out for learning strategies, you're pulled out, whatever it needs, but you're back in with, with gen ed as much as possible. So by the time you get to tier three, you're, you're, mo you're probably talking about classified children with an IEP, but tiers one and two are are for everybody. And actually, when, you, when you're looking at a lot of the best practices, tier one, two, and three supports are for special ed students as well. It's not, now that you're in special ed, you don't go tier one. We, we all get tier one. That's, that's kind of the, the purpose of it, and tier two. And yeah, it's flexible for those students as well. OK. And would it be that someone could be tier one at, on like one subject matter, and then like require tier two and something else, or like if it was li like literacy or... You know. Absolutely, and, and one of the main tenets is that, as I said, you're not a tier one kid forever, right? So right now you might be having trouble with multiplication or something, and so you need some support in a tier two smaller group environment for X number of weeks, right? And it's data driven of once, once Ms. Robinson reaches this, then she's no longer part of this group. And if she needs to go back, then she is part of this group. You know, that kind of flexibility, not grouping kids by tiers, right? Great. And would there be with, um, like, with the, the way that classes are run, like, you know, you're looking at class sizes and, and figuring out how um, those teachers would be able to group those children appropriately for their right. level, like, that would all be taken into yeah, account so along that's, your plan. Yeah, that's part of what we're talking about with systems and structures. How do we yeah. do that? And how do we support teachers in analyzing that data, right? How do we provide them the, uh, the expertise if they need it and the support if they need it, but also time and, and ability to do so? Thank you. Ms. Carousel? 
Um, I just want to say thank you for continuing to challenge what we're, you know, where we could do better. Um, I feel like you've made a lot of changes when you not changes improvements when you came on board as far as making things more consistent across the elementary school. So this is kind of an evolution of what's already been doing done, what the supervisors have been doing. So I just I'd like to see the progression and want to say thank you. And I think it's great to leverage what's working and the success we're having to build this. So thanks for the ongoing thanks. work on this. And thank you for this. Um, it sounds to me like a, a lot of this is like a looking at our INRS process and like a revamping uh, of all that, which is for general ed students. Yep. You know, the whole purpose of it is to support the kids that are not classifiable or don't meet the, the criteria for classification. So more of a uniform INRS procedure throughout the whole district. Yep. And INRS is, you know, sometimes used as a stepping stone to classification, which is, which is not really what the intent is, right? No, I, I actually think it's against the state code. Exactly. I've had that and, and I don't mean here it's used. I mean in, in general it's, it's often thought that way. And, and INRS and response to air intervention, RTI and, and MTSS, I mean it's alphabet soup at, at a certain point. But the, the gist of it is how do we help support individual teachers helping individual kids at all levels, right? And so that means um, if I'm in my class, okay, let me pull a small group of kids to work on this thing. Like, that's a tier one support, and we see that a lot in a reader's workshop or a writer's workshop or even a math workshop, right? And how do we, when we go to INRS, the first question isn't uh, how, do you, how do you fix this kid, right? The first question as a teacher is um, this, this kid is having a challenge and I've run out of, I've run out of strategies. Let me, let me go to my team of people, and now we start, like, working on it as a team, like a, a medical right. team might do so. Let's, let's, what's the, staff it? Is that your, your term for it? What's mm. it, where they get together and put all your minds together and-, and Like a multidisciplinary round type Something of like that, okay. rounds, rounds, that kind of thing. Like this idea of, of I know the kid really well, but these are the things I've tried and it's not working. Let me turn to my team, which is other grade level teachers, other upper or lower grade level teachers, or the child study team members, or the principal, or like, let's, let's all collectively work on this. That's the first step in INRS, right? And then we, we build from there. Not, right. let's send them out to the room of, of you know, somewhere to be fixed kind of thing. I know, so it's yeah. more so to help support the teacher. Absolutely. To develop, you know, because everybody has different ideas and it's always right. good to, because it's kind of an isolating profession, which is yep. why the INRS is nice because people can exchange their ideas. Yep. And so a lot of our conversations right now are about thinking about INRS teams or thinking about teams of teachers and how do we strengthen those teams, right? How are we coaching into those teams to, to better the team? How are they coaching into each other? How are they sub lending support to one another and, and building that, that capacity? What I was saying earlier, we have a lot of excellent teachers. We have a lot of resources. We have a lot of great stuff here. And, and the room that we have, I think, to grow is to make those teams of teachers collaboratively you know, better, right? The smartest person in the room is, is the room, not, not the teacher, right? The, the, Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Expect to hear more next month. I'm looking forward to it. Um, barring no other questions, we'll move to special services. So Dr. Dr. McKay couldn't make it tonight, so I'll go through what she had shared with me uh, quickly. The CST team, all levels, um, they're currently uh, working on student uh, program projections for next year. So programs, levels of services, and related services are all being discussed with students and parents at the IEP meetings. Did offer a couple of workshops, upper elementary executive functioning tips for at home. That was on March 6th at 7. This workshop provided parents with at home strategies, tools, and resources focused on topics such as organization, time management, attention, and study skills. It was presented by two of our school psychologists, and we had six parents that <coughs> attended. Uh, move up parent information night for rising sixth and ninth grade uh, parents for special education is on April 30th at 6.30 p.m. in the middle school, high school media center. And this will provide parents information specifically about the special education program and services offered at the middle and high school levels. Regarding Jana Lee, uh, an update, Jana Lee continues to visit the elementary schools and the middle school and high school, working with teachers on both responsive teaching strategies and co-teaching on our most recent visit to the high school. Uh, middle school on March 19th. She works specifically with co-teaching co pairs. Anything else for that, Greg? Good. Nope. So that's it for that. Over. 
Thank you. Now on to management and community. Um, so we talked about, yeah, the district communication plan and site security review analysis. So congratulations to the board. You're going to achieve your goals. Um, Woohoo. Uh, we do have the unused emergency closing day left. Um, so uh, our next board meeting is April 29th. Uh, we'd like to have it on that agenda for uh, approval so we can get as much notice out as possible. We had discussed, I think, last time very briefly of the Friday before Memorial Day weekend, which would be, uh, I think it's May 24th. Um, but again, the board has a range of uh, days to choose from. Uh, I just know that on the 24th, there is nothing going on. So it's an open day for us to use. I would recommend that the board stay out of June because we just have way too much going on. Um, uh, so I think June, I think the May 24th could be a good day. If you want another day, I would just have to do some research on it to make sure it's available. So okay. turn to the board. All right. Um, they should have a discussion, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, yeah. It's wrong. Like, fine. Okay. All right. Um, so any any um, trustees have any, you know, either initial recommendations or discussion items with regards to um, the use? Okay. All right. So can we do a straw poll just to see if, um, you know, who's in support of using the 24th, uh, knowing that there's no current major schedule uh, conflicts? So all those in favor? Okay. We have your straw poll. So what I'll do is um, I'll put that on the agenda for the 29th, and then we'll get it out the next day. So that'll be enough time for people to give notice, just in case something happens between now and the 29th, we'll just lay low. Uh, but that'll be the plan. Okay. Thank you. On to our business items. Sorry, Dr. Robinson, I have a hard time hearing you sometimes. Um, oh, so I have a lengthy report this evening, um, uh, which uh, Dr. Charleston clearly doesn't want to listen to. Um, <laughs> uh, so to, to say that we are uh, engaging on a, um, a, a rather ambitious uh, summer of capital projects is an understatement. Um, so uh, this is, will serve as the first of many updates that you will be getting. Um, and one thing can be said for certain, at almost every meeting from now through probably June, you will either be uh, accepting an, a, a bid, uh, allowing me to go out to bid, or allowing me to purchase something through a co-op. So uh, off we go. So <clears throat> we'll start with chronologically is then the first thing we have are our rod grants. Um, our high school roof, which is the roof directly above us, um, it went out to quote to a cooperative vendor. Uh, using a cooperative vendor allows us to not bid, uh, which is good for us because it gets us moving rather quickly. Um, it's primarily a restoration except for a small area, I believe, in the front, which will be a full replacement. Um, we anticipate getting back our quote and awarding at our April 22nd meeting. Um, Oh, sorry, 29, thank you so much. Um, and substantial completion uh, should be by August. So this, this will be all done uh, before school starts. So Coleman School, which is our other rod grant that was approved, uh, is, is, is developing into a problem. Uh, so when we went back to do some further core sampling of the roof, the uh, roofing company uh, identified conditions that would not be uh, uh, consistent with their initial uh, remediation plan of a restoration, but more of a full replacement. Uh, so that is going to take us out of the land of co-op and put us into the land of bids. Uh, it will also put us into the land of having to do uh, some related engineering as we were going to be ripping the entire roof off of the building and replacing it. All that being said, um, we will not be able to get this roof done for this summer. So the Coleman roof will push to the summer of 25. We anticipate that we will have uh, our bid ready to go out sometime this fall. So we will be first out of the gate 
that summer of next year and get this roof uh, repaired. We, we don't have any concerns about the roof, so it, we're not, by, by pushing it to next summer, really doesn't, it isn't influencing anything. Uh, the rod grant will still be available. The only downside to all of this is obviously a full replacement costs more than a restoration. So this project will come in above what we originally submitted for our rod grant. And that cost will have to be borne by the district because the rod grants don't allow you to go over. <clears throat> Do you have any idea how much? We are over? waiting on okay. that. Thank so you. we think that the delta is probably going to be somewhere around $10 a square foot from what they put into what it's actually going to cost us. So. We'll, we'll, we'll okay. see where that turns out to Great. be. <clears throat> Next is our home economics room. Um, we are all set to go out to bid uh, this Friday um, and award at our May 6th meeting. Um, it's going to go out with three alternatives. The first alternative bid is to replace our stainless steel uh, tables with four islands. Uh, the second option is going to be replacing the uh, veneer plastic con countertops like a, a Formica with a solid surface. And our third option is going to be a replacement of door panels um, with clear, uh, clear vi like vision through so that the, 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 the teacher can see inside of the, of the, of the base cabinet. Uh, without having to open it. So we're going to have those bid as alternates. We'll see where, where the, all of the bids, uh, you know, flow, and we'll make the decision appropriately. Uh, if I can get through my entire report on the room, then we can, oh, yeah. we can entertain questions. Um, our, uh, we met, we had our first uh, stakeholder meeting. So what we've been having are these internal stakeholder meetings with people who are either using the room, uh, the principal of the school, a teacher in some cases, um, have some input into what we're doing and talk about the room and the planning stations. We had our first meeting on Friday. Uh, we went over with them uh, the pallet for the room. They have provided some, some uh, recommendation and some uh, concerns about the initial design. We brought those to our uh, uh, architect and uh, we don't we, we believe we'll be able to come somewhere close to their expectation um, and keep the room um, on track for Friday uh, to get that bid out and th th this is the room that is um, of our highest priority in terms of timing because we don't have another kitchen to put a class to put that class into so uh, we, we're, we're trying real hard to hit um, all of our deadlines so that we can, in fact, ensure uh, the room will be available in September. Ms. Carr? Um, what was the add-ons or the alternates? So the way, it, the way it works is, is we're bidding a full gut and restoration upper lower uh, cabinetry, all new uh, appliances, uh, a reconfiguration of some of the storage, uh, new exhaust system. And then the bid package has alternatives. So, for instance, on the, on the islands, right, it, the base bid includes no island, and we'll just use the tables that we have, right? The second one is it includes countertops that are solid surface versus the veneer uh, laminate that we have in the base bid. In the base bid is solid doors. The alternative would give us... And clear doors. And what that allows us to do is if the base bid comes in lower than we think, we then can substitute some of the alternatives in and not have to rebid. These are not things that we're told when, when we're asked, and I'm not faulting anybody, but it, it, when I approved the, 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 the renovation, I thought it was soup to nuts, and now I'm being told that's not soup to nuts, and we may no, it have... No, it is soup to nuts, Ms. Carr. But, but, but you're saying that it doesn't come with... These are upgrades. It's kind of like when you go to buy a brand new home, and you see the model home, right? The model home may have all of the options, but the base home only has the base. So what you approved, right, for $750,000 was a complete job. We are still under a $750,000 budget. We're just saying if we save some money on some, let's say the floor comes in 
$25,000 cheaper than what was in the original budget, maybe then I can do the islands. So it just allows me to give more into the room at a full 750 without having to then go out and rebid. Correct. Okay. Correct. Which is a countertop. So. No, no, I know, but no pun intended. <laughs> <clears throat> um, next, we have the pre-K expansion here at the high school. So phase one, uh, which is our abatement and demolition phase, um, the bidding there is slated to go out uh, also on this Friday with an award of 520. Um, work will begin as soon as school is out, um, and we are moving forward with, um, we already had our environmental company come in. They've reviewed all of the areas. They have provided their remediation plan, and the uh, bid that, goes, that is going out is uh, 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 accomplishing each of the remediation steps identified by the environmentalist. We are then gonna run phase two, which is the construction phase of the preschool. We're gonna bid that out while we're in the middle of abatement in, in June um, and hope to award sometime during the summer with potentially a, a special meeting just to keep the ball rolling so that once remediation and demolition are over, we can get right into construction, which would then continue through the school year next year. Um, the, 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 the staging area is going to be where we all went out that, that evening where the playground would be. Uh, since that area is going to be uh, changed um, in its usage, we figured that's the best place to have our staging area. So that is where it'll be fenced nicely with a construction fence. That's where the uh, bins will go. That's where the trucks will be parked and all that kind of fun stuff far away from that side entrance of the, of, of the building, but close enough to that entryway for work to continue. <clears throat> and uh, so the, our first stakeholder, internal stakeholder meeting uh, with our architect is going to be happening, uh, if not this week, next. Uh, where we're going to start, uh, the, the architects have asked, you know, a bit about the te teaching methodologies and some of the thoughts about what kinds of equipment and uh, activity will be going on into the room, which would then try to be uh, uh, worked into the actual design of the room. So we're looking forward to that as well as working on some color palettes, which I will admit is not my strong suit. <clears throat> All right, so now we'll go down to the lower field. Um, so the lower field, there's two different projects going on. So we'll kind of talk about them separately. So we'll first talk about the actual replacement of the carpet and the expansion. So the, the, the initial thought is that that is going to be done under a cooperative uh, contract. Uh, so we will not be bidding. We will just be purchasing uh, the carpet from the company that I believe did the initial installations um, and who is a, a primary player in this space up here in, in, in northern New Jersey and for that matter throughout the state and country. Um, and so we have a very strong relationship uh, with, with that particular vendor and uh, they have uh, all but assured us we will have our field back uh, and usable by August 12th. So obviously that's the first day, I believe, Dr. Charleston, for some uh, for, for practices to start. So everything then went backwards from that date. Uh, so we are going to get that particular, the carpet and the expansion, we're gonna get that quote out to the cooperative vendor on 524, um, an award shortly thereafter, probably at the very next uh, board meeting. <clears throat> So once we turn over the field with the brand new carpet and the expansion, we will stop working on lights. So lights and carpet will, will start together. Beginning of June, I think, believe June 1st on is where we've blocked out the field. They will be working simultaneously. The lights will not be up by August 12th, but we will stop work so that we can have the the students 
participate in our fall sports on that brand new field. And then the lights will then be installed once the season is over. The, <clears throat> where we are in planning on the lights is we've had our preliminary engineering uh, assessments done. They were out here on, on surveys the other day. And in fact, I think yesterday, no, today. Um, and uh, we anticipate that bid to go out on May 24th with an award on June 24th. So again, those, th those two projects will work together. Um, they'll start at the same time. The field will be ready for use on the 12th. The lights will stop and then restart after the season. Um, the stakeholder meeting for that particular project um, has not met yet, um, but we will be getting together to talk about the colors of the field, how we want it striped, and all that kind of fun stuff. So that will be forthcoming. Our gym stairs, uh, which is probably the most vanilla of the projects that we're entertaining, um, pretty simple here, nothing really to report other than that we'll be bid, we're gonna get our bids out uh, for April 19th, and then we will award uh, on 520. I think the only thing that, 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 that has come up so far is we may have to redirect traffic in that back road of the high school when, when, this is, when, when the heavier construction is going on here. So we'll, we'll figure that out in-house. So I'm sorry, when is that expected to start? That is going to start probably in the l l mid to late July. But we'll be done before school starts. All of the projects we just discussed will be done by school. Those are also all the projects that we're working on with PSA. We have two additional projects that we're not working with PSA that we're doing in-house that'll be uh, coordinated by our uh, B&G staff with uh, an outside vendor. So the first one is our counter and sinks. Uh, so we got back um, our estimates from our cooperative vendor. Again, so we don't have to go out to bid. Um, a color palette has been selected. Material has been selected. Here we were able to get in a solid surface countertop. Um, and uh, we, the 13 rooms have been identified. This project's running at the moment slightly over, um, and we're going to try to get that uh, resolved um, in the process of the renovation. If not, we will, uh, once we come forward with you, to you with the uh, purchase and the awarding of the contract to the cooperative vendor, you will see a, a, a bit more of a price increase there. Uh, I think currently it's about $15,000, but we're working on that daily to try to bring that down. Uh, the last project that we'll talk about is our painting project. Again, also being done in-house, meaning B&G will be overseeing it. Um, the estimates are in. Uh, However, the, the original estimates were done with a non-co-op uh, painter, which means it probably didn't include prevailing wage on all of the painters. Uh, so when we went and we priced it with a uh, cooperative vendor, it came in a bit higher. So we're going to look for another cooperative vendor. Um, if we can't find a cooperative vendor, um, we, we may just bid it and see where, see where, where we come out. Um, so more to come on that one. And lastly, I will update you on ESIP. So with tonight's uh, vote, we are now uh, have a clear runway to selling our bonds. So on Wednesday morning, I believe at 1120, uh, myself, our energy consultants, uh, and our bond council and financial advisor are appearing before the BPU for their final blessing. The BPU, as, as, as an organization, has approved it, but now we have to go in front of the BPU board, which is, from our understanding of formality, we will get approved by the BPU, and then that will then set into uh, play uh, the final bond issuance activity. So on April 15th, we're having a ratings call with S&P. Um, after that ratings call, um, Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, will be uh, pricing out our bonds and then looking to place those bonds. We believe that the bonds will close sometime in May. Um, and once the bonds, in fact, do close, we will be in a position to begin uh, our 
renovations, which will continue for about 18 months. With, as, as Ms. Scarpelli asked earlier, with our first payment on those bonds anticipated to be in, in July of 2025. So that wraps up all of our projects. Uh, the only other thing that we really kind of need to talk about is our budget. Um, and at our next meeting, we will be able to have our uh, public hearing on the budget because the budget was approved by the state. Uh, that news came down, I believe it was last Thursday. And in conjunction with that, I, I, I just want to say I was very uh, proud of a colleague who got a hole in one on his half of the uh, budget, which was Mr. Van Nest, uh, something he said he would not get, but yet he did get. So <laughs> congratulations and kudos to him on that achievement. Um, we'll work on my hole in one in the future. Um, and what else do I need to talk about? Oh, we did have our RFP. Uh, we had two RFP openings. Um, last week uh, on Tuesday, um, and, and, and we could, attendance was light. Uh, the first one was the doctor, and we got no one, and the second one was for food service management company, which we got one, which was Pomptonian, so we, they'll be on our next agenda for appointment um, for, uh, I believe it's a two-year with three one-year renewals, um, and we will have that outlined for you moving forward. <clears throat> And we have one action item, which is uh, the appointment of Lurch, Vinci, and Bliss, our auditors, to uh, assist us in our bond issuance. Uh, they'll be on the S&P call. Um, there are some uh, registration statements that they'll be filling out, um, things of that nature. Uh, we, 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 we ran their cost through our bound council across the, 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 the closings that he's seeing, and we're dead smack in the middle with our, with our price. So uh, we feel real good about uh, recommending that to the board this evening for your approval. And I just want to make sure I hit everything. Ah, uh, New Jersey uh, school boards, uh, think early. Um, it is going to be October 21st through the 24th. Um, and what we were kind of thinking to maybe make it a little bit easier in terms of hotels, getting everybody into the same place, getting us someplace that maybe is uh, uh, nicer. Uh, uh, it, it, we, we thought that maybe we would recommend Oceans, which is one of the, um, the, the, the participating hotels. They offer a great deal. It's a nice, clean, modern room. Um, and if that is agreeable to the board, we will uh, move forward with making plans to have everybody there. Yes, is that good? Okay. And then that's it. <laughs> What's that? Can't hear you. Nobody's allowed. I don't think anyone wants to stay at the Nugget, so you're safe. <laughs> Based on your experience last year, good luck with your reservation. <laughs> they canceled on them the morning of. Um, I am absolutely sure that I am done now. So, uh, Dr. Robinson, all I would need is a motion for item B2. Um, Ms. Scarfelli. I just have a comment. So, I, I would like to know what the Coleman roof is going to come at before we, we do the lights. We have no idea what a full roof replacement will cost that will eat into our capital reserve account. So, I, I would like to have an idea of what that number is going to be because I know you would said that Coleman roof can't be done and now it's a more of a replacement as a refurbishment so that's just my feeling as a board I would like to have that number would hope everyone would want to know I what agree. that is knowing the impact it could could or couldn't have on our capital reserve was not something we anticipated I can tell you that that cost will not be the increase in the cost will not be a deterrent for any other project that we are currently being considered I, I, maximum, I would say maximum would be a two hundred thousand dollars win. I would still like to know that number. Of course, but we're I, going to provide you the number. Yeah, I mean it's already been approved, but I'm. As, we're going to provide as, you the number, but I do not okay. think it would be wise. But I will follow the direction of the board to hold up the lights okay. on a number that I 
that, that will not be significant enough to deter us from the course that the board has already uh, approved. Um, it may not be significant this year, but it in turn will be substantial significance to the future projects that were mentioned to, to us that or down the line. You know that. No, uh, I, I don't. I, I don't think it's material. Um, and in fact, I believe uh, that we will in fact have additions to our capital reserve yeah. far in excess of any overage on the Coleman roof as our June deposit. So, so we've had a very conservative um, think you'll have view of what we would have in surplus going into a capital reserve at the end of the year. And we had estimated, I think it was $500,000. Um, as we get closer and closer to, to June 30th, that number will be significantly more than $500,000. So I believe your capital reserve um, deposit uh, would be uh, pretty substantial, similar to what last year was, which was, I think, almost a couple of a million dollars. So I think our capital reserve, actually, I know our capital reserve numbers are fine. Um, they're healthy. And once we get the surplus coming in, um, as James said, it wouldn't, it's not going to deter us from any doing any future projects that we had identified. But but yes, we, will, we will get all those numbers we'll to report okay. as soon as we know it, which I would imagine I'd have that number at our 29th meeting. Thank you. Um, are there any discussion um, related to the ESA refunding bonds before we call for a motion to approve? Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the resolution for B2? Ms. Rundell? Seconded by Ms. Caracella. Are you able to call roll? Ms. Calvez? Yes. Ms. Carasola? Yes. Ms. Carr? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Ms. Garpelli? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Ms. Rundell? Yes. Dr. Robinson? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, can we have a motion to approve? Firm the um, the decision made in the Cole Hib two six one four seven eight. All right, Ms. Rundell, seconded by Ms. Stevenson. Can we call roll? Ms. Calvez. Yes. Ms. Carasola. Yes. Ms. Carr. Yes. Mr. Corey. Yes. Ms. Garpelli. Yes. Ms. Stevenson. Yes. Ms. Rundell. Yes. Dr. Robinson. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Are there any liaison reports? Okay. All right. Um, barring no uh, liaison reports, um, we're going to open um, our second uh, comment section. Uh, this one is for agenda items only. We're opening at 9.37. Seeing no members of the public present, we are closing at 937. Um, we actually need to make a motion to go back into close to discuss an item. There will be no um, action items or no actionable, uh, no action will be taken. Thank you. It's late. No action will be taken. I need a motion to go back into close. Mr. Corey. Um, Seconded by Ms. Scarpelli enthusiastically, I see. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. All right. So let's just take not even five minutes so Keith can get all the mics and get him out of here, and then we'll start because i got to stretch my legs. Okay.